All right, why don't we uh, get going? It's Friday, the last day, the last set of lectures. I'm all that stands between you and the much anticipated buffet lunch. Uh, I've been requested to ask you to fill out this feedback form. That is the, uh, the penultimate, but the double penultimate page of this little book here. It says, give us your feedback. Uh, and you can either do it, I guess, uh, with a dead tree version, by just removing this page, filling it out and removing it and leaving it out on the table. Uh, there is also a way to do it online. Uh, the organizers would much appreciate your thoughts about the strengths and weaknesses of this enterprise. Uh, I think we all think it's been a lot of fun, but you're ultimately customers of the work, so nice to know what you think. And if you don't want to leave your name or email, if you want to make it anonymous, uh, you won't be purged your way. Uh, it is also uh, American Independence Day. So, happy American Independence Day. Go team, who's up? Right. So, when you get to my career stage, you have a stock of lectures that you give of things like this. And so, when there's another opportunity comes up, you sort of think, okay. Which thing do I want to talk about this time? When you try to match your existing stock of slides, perhaps with some modification, to the uh, the things that the organizers wish you to talk about. Uh, I don't work a lot on inequality in the direction of some of the speakers that we've heard this week. Um, so I've been talking about that. Uh, I do I do work on a lot of method stuff, uh, and I do some stand work too. Actually, in my first slide here tells you what I work on just in case uh, it hasn't been apparent or isn't completely apparent from the lectures today and from my comments. Uh, if there are things maybe that you want to talk about uh, over lunch, I'd probably say what are the other things I work on that you haven't heard about here. So I'm going to talk today about social experiments. This is going to be a complement to rather than a substitute for what you heard yesterday from Scott. So I went through all of Scott's 190 slides. Uh, last night and this morning. I don't actually know how many of the 190 slides he went through. Uh, so, uh, I won't presume anything. Uh, there were lots of pictures. <coughs> and pictures of, of happy looking people taking tests or getting, getting medical treatment or anything. But uh, I did work on social experiments and you'll hear some of that in the first of the two lectures today. With, a, with an emphasis, not an exclusive emphasis, but a primary emphasis on therapeutic treatment effects. So part of why I'll be talking about social experiments is just so that when I'm talking about therapeutic treatment effects, I don't have to worry about selection functions. So I can just focus on the treatment effects that I can uh, I do a bunch of work, methodological work, applied and kind of metric work. I'm not a theoretical econometrician. I don't write papers for proofs in general. But I am an applied econometrician. Uh, I find algorithms and estimators very interesting and the intuition behind why which ones work better and which ones don't to be quite fun, as you will see. So a lot of that early work was on matching. I also more recently have done some applied econometric work on regression to continuity that I won't be talking about today. The second lecture, more or less, will be on matching and weighting estimators. So social programs, treatments, whatever you want to call them, are ways to address inequality. So the link between most of what I'm going to talk about today and the theme of the conference is, well, we want to address inequality with social programs, we need to evaluate those programs. That's point one. Point two is it may be that those programs have heterogeneous treatment effects. That heterogeneity in the treatment effects may itself affect the amount of inequality. Right? A program with a mean impact of 10, where half the people have outcomes, have impacts of a million and 10, and half the people have outcomes of impacts of minus a million, is going to increase inequality. Right? It's going to raise the mean a little bit and increase the quality a lot. So we care about energy and treatment effects if we care about inequality. I think you heard a little bit yesterday from Scott about what I would call performance management. I think he called it outcome measurement or something like that. Uh, performance management is an odd and mostly pernicious thing, I would say. Uh, if any of you are interested in it, it's very big in the development world. It's also very big in the world of active labor market programs which is one of the substantive areas that I work in. 
uh, performance management can be viewed as attempting to do serious program evaluations on the chief, quickly and cheaply. And I would add badly, we put aside any history of two. We can talk about that as much as we can. Uh, active labor market programs, less of an issue in most developing countries, particularly developing countries that are doing well. Uh, a very big issue in Europe, in particular, where they took us out persistently uh, and annoyingly high unemployment rates, oftentimes for use, find programmatic ways to improve their outcomes. I find the design and uh, the design and evaluation of those programs quite interesting. And finally, I have a line of research on uh, the effects of university quality on labor market outcomes. That's why I asked that question the other day about differences in college quality in China. Uh, I find this really interesting too. This is a literature that is very much the opposite of this. Right? It, there is no hope of ever having really clean identification and you need to do reverse quality. Nonetheless, I think it's an important question. And so I feel like this and this use kind of different parts of my brain and or different parts of my economic training or something. And I like them both. Anyway, today, this with a focus on heterogeneity and then some of this. Uh, so lecture one, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna go until uh, 10:30. And we'll stop and take a break wherever we are. I think we'll be some some part way to lecture two at that point, and uh, and then I'll go as far into lecture two as I can. I have a course in the tradition of my advisor prepared for too many slides. Uh, that's okay. You're gonna get the slides. You can read the ones I don't get through. Uh, I would much rather go slowly and have everybody learn stuff uh, than try to rush through and get through every possible slide. Uh, back in the day, we had these physical slides. You may have seen them. They were, they were like clear plastic. And you would print your, your stuff on them, and then you'd carry your stack of physical slides into your presentation. And those physical slides had the useful feature that they, they forced you to go a little bit more slowly. Right. Just the physical act of changing one slide to the other was much slower than doing this, right? <laughs> and actually, I have a, an invention which I will offer to you for free, which is one of these clickers where if you go backwards and forwards in a very short time interval, it gives an electric shock to the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I think this would improve presentations tremendously. But you want to show. <laughs> yes, we don't want to let her do the guy. That's, uh, <laughs> anyway, all right. Here's lecture one. I'm going to talk about notation, talk about parameters of interest, talk about this. This is sort of known now, but it's 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 a battle that was fought and won. It's not true that the battle didn't be fought and won. Then I'm going to talk about heterogeneous treatment effect. This is going to be the longest part of the lecture, as we'd like to hear. Then I'll talk about other things you might do with experiments. Then I'll talk about the equilibrium evaluation and their relationship to the experiment, and then I will conclude this part of the discussion. Of course, as always, you should feel free to ask questions. You should feel free to say, Jeff, you're talking too quickly. I'm trying to put on my slow voice that I use in Europe, too. Uh, we'll see if I can see. <laughs> also, just have a whole lot of tea at breakfast, so I'm going to ramp up on caffeine. All right, this is the standard notation. I think you saw a little bit of this yesterday from Scott. Uh, so we have the potential outcomes framework, as it's called. Y1 is the outcome in the treated state. Y0 is the outcome in the untreated state. You can generalize this to multiple treatments if you care to. Uh, people argue about who should be held responsible for the potential outcomes framework. So if you are a friend of Don Rubin, this is called the Rubin causal model. If you are a statistician who is not a friend of John Rubin, this is called the Neyman Rubin model. If you are my advisor, this is called the Fisher Neyman Roy Quantum model. <laughs> <laughs> my contribution to the discussion is to add Frost. Do you know who Frost is? Frost is the poet Robert Frost. And before any of these guys wrote their papers, he wrote a poem called The Road Not Taken which seems to me to embody the potential outcome framework, if yes. not notationally, at least conceptually. Uh, so I thought we could kind of raise the cultural level of the enterprise and, and, and bring it into point of discussion by crediting Robert Frost. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. The fundamental problem is we only ever observe one of these, right? For each unit, 
person, enterprise, county, country, whatever it is, is either feed or not feed. We only serve in one state. And so the whole thing, much of what we do in empirical economics, in fact, I would argue in some sense that almost all of empirical economics except prediction is program evaluation. If we define program evaluation as trying to obtain counterfactuals. Right? That's what we were doing yesterday in Chapu's lecture, even though we were doing it in the structural framework, we were trying to obtain counterfactuals. There were different paths to trying to obtain counterfactuals. That's the fundamental problem. I'm going to use D. This is a way to tell, in part, uh, who hangs out with whom, what letters they use for the treatment. So I'm going to let D be an indicator of participation in the program, because I'm going to also talk about random assignment. I'm going to define a second variable called R for random assignment into the treatment group. So I'm imagining a voluntary program. Not all programs are voluntary, but some of the ones that get evaluated are voluntary. If you volunteer to be in the program, D is equal to 1. Then the assignment then takes place. Some people with D is equal to 1 are randomly assigned to the treatment group. Some people are randomly assigned to the control group. That's how random assignment solves the fundamental evaluation problem. It forces some people who wanted to experience Y1 to experience Y0 instead. Right? This is why random assignment is sometimes ethically problematic, is it involves force. Right? It's taking some people who wanted to be treated, treating them, and maybe some people who didn't want to be treated, and taking some people who wanted to be treated and not treating them, and taking some people who didn't want to be treated. All right, the usual parameter is <coughs> the impact of treatment on the treated. That's the expected difference in the population between the treated outcome and the untreated outcome for the treated unit. In a standard cost benefit framework, we can compare this in dollar terms to the average cost of the program and do a simple up or down cost benefit calculation. Should we keep the program? Should we get rid of it? In experiment, you estimate this by comparing the treated units, the untreated units, the mean outcome. So it's simple step. We all know that. Experiments require assumptions. Here was a bit of this in Scott's lecture too. First one is no randomization bias. And it's important the literature sometimes confuses randomization bias with Hawthorne effect or John Henry effect. Hawthorne effect is an effect that comes from being observed. Hawthorne effects can arise in experimental evaluations as well as in non-experimental evaluations. The idea is just you behave differently because you know a researcher is watching. That doesn't depend on random assignment. Randomization bias is a narrower thing. It means that you behave differently because of the presence of the randomization. All right, so let's suppose that there is some program that you want to take, and if you knew that you were going to take the program with certainty, you would undertake some preliminary activities before the program. You would brush up. Maybe if the training program, you would brush up on things you covered in high school before the training program. But because you know there's only a 0.5 probability that you'll get into the program, the optimal amount of those preparatory activities may be smaller. That means that the experimental evaluation is going to estimate a treatment effect parameter when everybody is less prepared, which does not correspond to the actual effect of the program when it is operating without random assignment, because in that world, people would fully prepare because they would not be they would not be anticipating potential randomization, and that's the wasting of their preparatory effort. Right? That's what I have in mind by randomization bias. We know very little about this empirically. Uh, there's a new paper by my friend Barbara Cianese at the Institute for Physical Studies. ERAD is a big experiment that was done in the United Kingdom to test an intervention that helped low-skilled workers after they got a job. Most interventions try to help low-skilled workers get jobs. The idea with this was to help them keep a job uh, by sort of providing counseling and things during the time that they were employed. So if they got really upset at their boss, there was a phone number, they'd like, call up, and someone would say, chill out, dude. Don't yell at the boss, he'll fire you. And they would say, oh, thanks, I won't yell at the boss. That was kind of the idea. Treatment group dropout and control group substitution. In some experiments, this is not an issue. In the experiments that Scott talked about yesterday, there was some of this, sometimes not. It depends very much on the nature of the experiment. Sometimes the person doing the experiment can force the treatment group to get the treatment and can absolutely prevent the control group from getting the treatment. 
Other times that's not true. So there's a couple of published discussions. Maria Techman had all papers about this. This does not keep you from having an interesting, compellingly causal estimate of something. But what it does is it changes to something of which you have a compelling causal estimate. And it may change it to something that's more interesting, and it may change it to something that's less interesting. And that's what these papers worry about. Experiments in general, there's a couple exceptions we'll talk about later, assume something called the stable unit treatment value assumption. This is an awkward phrase that comes from the statistics literature. Uh, and you can put it into economics jargon by saying no general equilibrium effect, no spillovers. Everybody has Y1 or Y0 central run to their forehead, and Y1 and Y0 are invariant to who else gets treated, or how many people get treated, or anything else. They're just features of the unit that are invariant to everything else. That's a very strong assumption, by the way. Might be plausible in some contexts, not plausible in others. It is also an assumption that is made implicitly in many non-experimental evaluations as well. For whatever reason, it's talked about a bit more in the experimental literature than in the non-experimental literature, at least in the labor and development worlds. And in a sense, all of macro is about this, right? Or much of macro is about this. Um, so this was news when, when Heckman and Smith uh, wrote, when we wrote our Journal of Economic Perspectives paper that was published in 1995, people from NPRC, which is a research organization in the US that does a lot of social experiments, we're going around saying the great thing about experiments is you don't have to make the assumptions. And so the thing we were trying to say in that article, one of the things we were trying to say is, hold on, experiments require assumptions too, some of which are not readily testable, like the general equilibrium effect assumption. You can try to go after that empirically, but you have to do other stuff. You have to gather other data than you would typically collect in a simple partial equilibrium experiment. Yes, sir. I suppose, yeah, what we have the general equilibrium effect, also we have the social interaction. Is it possible to you know, identify both? <coughs> One is from the price, right? The general equilibrium effect, so. So I'm going to think general equilibrium effect perhaps overly broadly here. Mm -hmm. I mean, any, any departure from the simplest case where, where Y1 and Y0 are fixed for each unit. Okay. So that might be too strong. Certainly there are many types of effects, right? You might have a narrow definition of general equilibrium effect, which means effects that work through prices, for example, or through displacement in the context of an actual labor market program. But I'm using it to mean this much broader. There's many ways to do random assignment, it turns out. And uh, in the U.S. context, again, this is a bit less true in a developing country context, I think, in general, and that's part of why RCTs are so common in development economics. In the U.S. context, random assignment can be politically problematic uh, in ways that it is often implemented. So Canadians never do random assignment, more or less. Uh, and when economists in Canada complain to the people in the Canadian version of the Department of Labor and say, why don't you do any experiments, they say, well, we're required by law to serve everybody in this program. We can't deny anybody services. And of course, a control group implies denying some people services. Right? Other people worry about ethical issues with random assignment, that force aspect that I talked about before. Right? In clinical trials in medicine, there's a whole formal apparatus set up. So if you're doing a clinical trial in medicine of a new drug, and it seems that the new drug is working really, really well to treat a serious condition, they may stop the randomized trial in the middle and give the drug to everybody. Because it's viewed as being unethical, they continue to withhold it. The minute you figure out that it has a substantively important positive treatment effect. Now, most of the things that economists randomize, they're not gonna save anybody's life. Uh, maybe they make them a bit better off, maybe they don't. But that's some of the issue that people sometimes have with random assignment. One way to get around these political concerns sometimes is to randomly assign in a different way. So for example, this paper here, one of my favorite of my own papers, I guess, uh, Blacksmith, Berger, Knoll, did random assignment at the margin. So there's a program in the US called the Worker Profiling and Reemployment Services System. I don't 
a very long phrase. What this thing does, if you start a new spell of unemployment insurance, somebody in your state has estimated a model that predicts how likely you are to use up all your unemployment insurance benefits as a function of your characteristics observed at the beginning of the spell. You start a new spell, you go down to the office, you say, I'm unemployed, I need to be getting checks. And they say, aha, let's put your observed characteristics into this model. If you have a high predicted probability of using all your benefits, you're forced to receive services early in your spell. Right? It will take some of your benefits away. That's what this program does. So we, we uh, were assigned to evaluate this program, and we tried to talk the state of Kentucky into doing random assignments. They said, nope, we don't want to do that, because we want to be sure that we treat all the people with really high predicted probabilities of exhausting their benefits, because otherwise they're really expensive, and if we don't, if we don't treat all of them, it'll cost us a lot of money. And so we said, okay, let's do it a different way. It turned out that the way they set up this program they took this estimated probability of exhausting your benefits. They made it into a discrete number between 1 and 20, so 20 bins of width 0.05. If your probability was between 0.95 and 1, you were 20. If it was between 0 and 0.05, you were 1, so on and so forth. In each local office in Kentucky in each week, they had a number of slots. They had a number of unemployed people. They took the people with the highest number, and they started assigning them to the slots in the order of their predicted probabilities. When they got to the marginal number, we talked them to doing random assignment. Right? So suppose this local office had 10 slots. They fill up nine of the slots with the people with scores from 20 to 15. Now they're down to the people with a score of 14. There's four of them, but there's only one slot left. They would assign one of those four people to the slot at random. So they're not going to random assign of everybody. The people in that office with scores from 20 to 15 don't get randomly assigned in that week. They all get treated. The people with scores from 1 to 13, they don't get randomly assigned either. They don't get treated. But the people with the score of 14, they get randomly assigned. Yeah? Yeah, so for, for that, it only can identify the local treatment effect. Exactly. It identifies the treatment effect at the margin. So the cost here, two costs here. Right? The gain is we got to do random assignment. So we had compelling identification of something. The cost, perhaps it's a cost, perhaps it's a benefit are twofold. First of all, our sample size is a lot smaller. So we got to end, right? Our experimental sample is just these guys in these marginal cells. Secondly, we estimate a different parameter. We estimate the effect of this requirement to receive reemployment services early in your spell for people at the margin of being required to receive them. Now, in policy terms, that's actually a pretty interesting parameter. Because you might imagine that one policy question you would ask is, Suppose we're going to increase or decrease the number of slots a little bit. Well, if that's the policy question, increasing or decreasing the slots a little bit, this is exactly the parameter you want to estimate. You don't want treatment on the treat. You want treatment on people who are at the margin of being treated. And that's what we estimated. And uh, thanks to our anonymous referee, who we call Josh, uh, this was published in the AR. <laughs> he seemed to find that interesting, and we're glad he did. Um, Another talk I could give, which I'm not going to get today, would be on statistical treatment rules, uh, which are rules for trying to use statistics to determine who to treat in the context of some sort of programming. For those kind of rules, it's nice to do multi-stage random assignment. So I have a colleague called uh, Susan Murphy. Actually, a big MacArthur genius now, it turns out. And she studies statistical treatment rules in mental health. And so there, you have some treatments. Heterogeneous treatment effects are very important in that world. You have some treatments that are less effective but don't have bad side effects, and you have treatments that are more effective and do have bad side effects. And so you do this multi-stage thing. You start out with the less effective, lower side effect treatments, and then move on to the more effective <coughs> side effect treatments. And they get to do multi-stage random assignments. So they can, they can strike people out and randomly assign them to one treatment, and then based on what happens there, they can randomly assign them to another. Those are very nice for statistical treatment goals. Labor economists never get to do that. Let me highlight one more of these, and that is random assignment of incentives to participate. So the statistics literature calls this a randomized encouragement design. Essentially, what you're doing here is you're creating your own instrumental variable. Right? You're not assigning people to treatment, you're assigning them 
differences in the costs and benefits of participating in treatment. And this is often politically palatable when standard random assignment is not, right? You're not denying services to anybody. We tried to get Canadians to do this too, by the way, and they have a business. But this would not be illegal for them to do, right? They could randomly take unemployed people and send half of them a voucher that said, hey, if you come down to the Office of the Job Training Program and check us out, we'll give you an Amazon gift card or whatever. That would be perfectly legal. And assuming that Amazon gift card was generous enough, it would generate exogenous variation in participation. Now, as you all probably know, that would estimate a local average treatment effect. It would not estimate treatment treated. But again, that's an interesting policy parameter. Not the only policy parameter, but it's a potentially interesting policy parameter. All right. Now I'm going to, I think, move on from things that Scott touched on yesterday. Yes, sir. So, so is there a, a, a literature on, on optimal design and randomization schemes? Yep. But, well, be careful. There's, there is, tell me what you mean by that. What are, what are the choice variables in your imagination? Well, I, I would imagine that you could, you could, you could, you could write down a problem where, I guess, I guess I'm now thinking about this in a Bayesian framework because I'm incapable of thinking in other ways, where you cool. talk about the parameters you want to measure and maybe your mm -hmm. loss function is distance from them. And now what you want to do is you, 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 you want a, a, a scheme that, uh, um, uh, you have some model about, about what's going on, mm -hmm. right? And then you have some scheme that just, just gives you, you know, probability assignments for different individuals based on their characteristics, uh, subject to the constraints, which might even include, for example, political constraints. Mm -hmm. you know, say, mm -hmm. what, what, can, what can you, what, 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 what correlates can you use for randomization, in your randomization scheme, and what can't you? So that's kind of the problem we have in mind. Is that? People do a less ambitious version than what you described uh, of that. So one nice thing about the random assignment literature, which could be usefully ported over to the literature on non-experimental evaluation, is that people who are going to do randomized evaluation usually do a power calculation first. Mm -hmm. And there, I think the reason it's more common in this literature is that you're about to pay on cost, right? Typically, non-experimental evaluations of secondary data, the main cost is your time, right? If it turns out that you do the analysis and you didn't have any power, Okay, wasted some time, but you didn't waste much money. Randomized evaluations cost a lot of money. And so you want to try to get the right ex ante. And that's a nice thing. And so people will will uh, will do power calculations to try to figure out how big does the sample size have to be to estimate what I think is a reasonably likely size treatment effect with given probability. Right? Excuse me. And then they'll oftentimes be thinking in their head about, well, you know, really. I'd like to, I have two treatments I care about, and I'd like to cross them, right? So some people get one, some people get two, some people get zero, some people get both, and then that's a separate power calculation, and then you add in the third, and, and so oftentimes our business with the students is to try to get them to come back from, I want to do five treatments, to four, to three, to two, by pressing them to keep doing the power calculations, realizing that that's, that's not in the budget, right? It's not in the budget. Um, what people don't do is kind of extend that calculation to thinking about the different versions of random assignment that are identifying different parameters that I had in the previous slide. That would be done more informally. So I try to get kids sitting, you know, before you get the analyst fly out and clean all the data and do all this stuff. And, you know, just sit down, spend an afternoon figuring out, you know, what's how much covariance are the x's going to explain? And you know, sort of do a little power calculation, you might save yourself months of time. But it's very hard to get students to do that. I don't know why. All right. What does experiment give you? Experiments give you the marginal distribution of outcomes. Right? The treated group gives you the marginal distribution of treated outcomes for assuming full compliance. The control group gives you the marginal distribution of untreated outcomes. Those are very useful, right? And they're all you need to calculate mean impact. They're also all you need to calculate quantile treatment effects, which we'll discuss shortly. However, if you had the joint distribution, right, if you knew how y1 and y0 covary, which is not something that you learn from the experimental data or from usual non-experimental methods, you could estimate a bunch of other parameters, which are really cool. So what fraction of people benefit from the treatment? <laughs> That'd be cool to know. The marginal distributions don't tell you that. Right? If you have a mean impact of 100, that's completely compatible with one unit benefit and every unit benefit, right? depending on what you assume about the distribution of impacts. The marginals just don't tell you that. 
Maybe you'd like to know the distribution of impacts, right? So if we think of the impact as being delta, y1 minus y0, what's f of delta? That'd be really cool to know. Right? That would tell you this, of course. It would also tell you this, the variance of the impacts. So almost all of applied economics, even today, implicitly assumes that this is zero. It implicitly assumes the common effect model. Right? This is the micro version of representative agent irrigation. Right? Everybody has the same effect of treatment. Oftentimes it's not written down explicitly, but you will just see people talk about the effect of a year of schooling, the effect of a job training program, the effect of a health intervention. Well, when you say the effect, that's saying there's just one. It's the same for everybody, implicitly. Papers are written like that. Well, the world is different if there is no the effect, if there's separate effects for every unit. And that's a part of this lecture is to kind of get you enthused about the notion that whenever you say, whenever you see a paper that talks about the effect of something, your skin should tingle, you should, you should cross it out and be upset uh, and think about a paper you might write. So I'm going to draw this picture later on. So this is the point. Experiment, non-experimental methods that we standardly do them to be marginals. If we had the joint, we could do some cool stuff. Let's think about that. Mm. Okay, all right. Pardon? What's it? What am I not doing right? new program came out, so it will change the base to the PDF. Ah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. No, that's not like that. That's your kid. I'm not bad. Good. Good. Here we go. All right, so essentially what I'm talking about is described in more detail. And we get two papers here. So we have some comments, Review of Economic Studies, Jabari and Smith, Journal of Econometrics, 2008. Jabari is a student of mine from Maryland days. You can think about Jabari and Smith as being Texas with the comments, the way I would have wrote it, would have written it, uh, instead of Jim and also updated for the intervening 11 years of progress in the literature and applied to a different data set. So Heckman, Smith, and Clemens used data from a job training evaluation in the U.S. Jabari and Smith used data from the Progressive evaluation that we've heard mentioned in Mark's lecture uh, this week. Uh, Habib, the rest of Habib's dissertation was also using the Progressive data, although unfortunately that she got scooped on some of what she did. Uh, so we used that for this. So let's take a simple example. Right? The first strategy we talk about in those two papers are what labor economists used to call bounds, but as we were discussing yesterday, this is probably for you. Uh, more expensive economists from I.O. or econometrics call this set identification or partial identification. Uh, you know, labor economists are simple plain speaking people, so this is okay to say bounds. Um, so it turns out, and we talked about this a bit on Monday, a long time ago, four days ago with Yoshida, that the marginal distribution, remember I asked him about the bounds. I asked him if Dudley Duncan had gotten all the way to thinking about the pressure hopping bounds. He had not. Pressure hopping bounds are a mathematical result that tells you, for given marginals, how much can you limit the set of possible joint distributions. It's a very cool result. Here's the formula. Pretty cool. So Frechet, the French statistician, who um, is oftentimes you know, just called the Freche bound. Popping is a German statistician. He had the misfortune of publishing in German during the war. Uh, so his work didn't get as much attention. I guess we're rehabilitating him or something. This is the formula. I want to do a really simple example to sort of show you how this works. So the simplest possible example. It's very much like the example that we do in the Journal of Economic Perspectives paper. So let's think about the job training program. I always think about job training programs. And let's think about employment or not in some period after random assignment. So employment is a binary outcome. So the joint distribution can be described by a two by two table. Right. 
So that's the setup that we have. Right? Control, the control group is the rows. Right? The control state, the untreated state is the rows. And by my assumption here, in the control state, 40% of people are not employed and 60% of people are employed. This is a very successful program in a meeting sense. This is the treated state, so people who are randomly assigned to the treatment. 80% of them are employed, 20% of them are not employed. Right. So our question is, perhaps, we'd like to know what are the four elements that you'd like to take? We'd like to know the joint distribution. That will tell us how many people are employed in both states, not employed in either state, not employed in the control state, but employed in the treatment state, and not employed in the treatment state, but employed in the control state. We might particularly be worried about this cell. Right? These are people who are made worse off by the treatment. There are people who are employed in the untreated state and not employed in the treatment state. How could that happen, you say? Well, it could happen in the following way. Suppose the treatment consists of sitting in the classroom for a few months. While you're sitting in the classroom for a few months, you are not searching for a job. Right? Your counterfactual self, had they not been sitting in the classroom, might have found a job. Your treated self sits in the classroom, then goes looking for a job and doesn't find it. So it's easy enough to tell stories about why the cell should be non empty. So we have three pieces of information. Right? We have this, we have this problem, right? These two probabilities have to sum up to one. That's a piece of information one, and then we know the probability of employment in just these days. But we have four cells. So we don't have enough. But the fresh hay hopping bound allow us to bound the fraction of the data in each of these cells, even though they don't want to identify the fraction of the data in each cell. If I were willing to assume that the treatment didn't make anybody worse off, right, if I were willing to assume that this cell was zero, maybe I have a firm belief in the efficacy of the treatment, and in some context that might be reasonable. If I can make this cell zero, then I can fill in all the rest. Right? Because then I'd have three unknowns and three pieces of information. But as it stands here, without any additional information, I, have, I know three things and I need to fill in four cells. So here's the formula for the joint distribution. So let's think about the zero, zero cell. So let's think about constructing the bound on f of zero, zero. That's the CDF of the joint distribution, the fraction of the population that's in the zero, zero cell. So the formula says the lower bound is f1 of zero, so the fraction in the, that has zero in the marginal distribution of the treatment group, f0 of zero, the fraction of the marginal distribution of the untreated group that is not employed, minus one, and zero, take the max of that. Well, this is 0.2, this is 0 0.4, 0 0.2 plus 0.4 is 0.6, minus one is minus 0.4. So the max of minus 0.4 and 0 is 0. So the lower bound on the number of, of the fraction of the population in here is 0. How about the upper bound? The upper bound is just the min of the fraction not employed in the two marginals. Right? And that has to be true. Right? So we're asking what the largest number of people who can be unemployed in the treated state and the control state cannot be larger than the fraction of people unemployed in either of these two states by themselves, right? If only 20% of people in the treated state are not employed, the most, of, the largest number of people that could be in here is 20%, right? So they have to be unemployed in both states. So we have just applied the fresh a hopping bound to bound the fraction of the population in this cell. Now I'm being loosey-goosey about standard errors here. We do all this with standard error. It's between zero and point two. That's kind of cool, right? These bounds are not hopelessly uninformative. One of the knocks on the bounding literature uh, is that the bounds are often hopelessly uninformative, unless you know, he's a co-author, then they seem to magically become more informative. Uh, but in this context, that's a lot, right? Without any information, we would say this could be between 0 and 1. Given the marginals, we know this is between 0 and 0.2. So we've eliminated 80% of the possible values given our knowledge of the bounding of the marginals plus the formula for the fresh hopping bound. So that's kind of cool. And you can apply this formula, I'm not going to go through it, you can apply it to the other three cells. 
and get down by everyone. Pretty cool. Have you seen that before? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's cool. <laughs> uh, you can also do this for continuous random variables. So it turns out that you can show that the, that certain classes of parameters, certain classes of functions of the joint distribution achieve their minimum and maximum values when the rank correlation is assumed to be minus one or one. And so what does that mean? I have this picture here. I think the Viva must have made this is from the people with the Viva to come out with this kind of stuff. Here are the outcomes in the control state. So this is the distribution of untreated outcomes arranged in order from smallest to largest. Here is the distribution of treated outcomes arranged in order from smallest to largest. If I assume, assume for the moment that these two groups are the same size, as you can see how to handle this case where they're not, assume they're the same size, rank correlation of one means that the counterfactual where the treated unit with the best outcome is the control unit with the best outcome. The counterfactual for the treated unit with the median outcome is the control unit with the median outcome. The counterfactual for the treated unit with the worst outcome is the control unit with the worst outcome. That's one of the two bounding distributions. That's the distribution with a rank correlation of plus one. That minimizes, you can show, the variance of the impact. So you can do a test, and it's outlined in Appendix E of Heckman, Smith, and Clements which, as is very much in the spirit of my esteemed advisor, could be a paper by itself, but instead it's Appendix E uh, of, this, of this paper. We outline how to test the null hypothesis that the variance of the impact is zero. Right? That's a really interesting null. As I told you before, you all kind of shook your head because you realized it was true that most applied literature and economics proceeds as if the impact variance is zero. So that's a pretty interesting null to test. It's a puzzle to me that we don't test that null more often. Why is it a little bit tricky to test that null? It's a little bit tricky to test that null because zero is at the boundary of the parameter space. Right? So it's a general feature of statistical tests that things tend to be a little more tricky if you're trying to test a null that is at the edge of the set of possible values of the parameter. Right? This is a null about the variance of the impact. The variance can't be negative. So zero is right, the variance has to be from zero to infinity with a square bracket, right? It can be zero. It can be less than zero. And so it turns out that that makes the test a little bit trickier because the null is at the edge of the parameter space. But Heckman Smith and Clements show how to deal with that. It's kind of nice, I think. I think we're, in fact, rediscovering in a somewhat simpler way stuff that was probably already out there in the statistics literature. But there you go. Don't know that always. The other extreme case that maximizes the variance of the impact is the case where the rank correlation is minus one. So this arrow and this arrow, and you can imagine the sequence of arrows in between correspond to the rank correlation of one. This arrow and this arrow correspond to the rank correlation of minus one. So for the rank correlation of minus one, you take the untreated units and you flip them like this, and then you match across. So with the rank correlation of minus one, the counterfactual for the treated unit with the best outcome is the control unit with the worst outcome. The counterfactual for the treated unit with the worst outcome is the control unit with the best outcome. You can sort of see why that's going to generate a large variance of impacts. Right? When you take the treated unit with the best and the control unit with the worst, that's probably going to be a big number. When you take the control unit with the treated unit with the worst, the control unit with the best, that's probably going to be a big negative number if the treatment is affected. So that's kind of cool. Yes. What is the sample size of these uh, treatment and control is not the same? So what we do that is actually tr uh, not the case in either of the data sets that are examined in Heckman, Smith, and Clemens, or Jabari and Smith. And so what we do is we collapse the data to percentiles and then do the exercise in percentiles. There's a little bit of slippage conceptually in there, right? But I don't think it I don't think it affects the story over much. So there's always a hundred percentiles. You could do it if you had good enough samples. You could do whatever you call thousands, quantiles of thousands, quantiles of ten thousand, whatever. Good question. Other questions? 
I don't know, I think that's just a good Yes, sir. So this suggests that what you might want to do is is, is find some confidence interval of, uh, of uh, impact areas and then use those to improve the bounds. <laughs> Do that to improve your and then use those to improve the bounds by by, by thinking about those as constraints on the yep. the shape of the So a lot of what the IO literature on set identification has spent its time doing is thinking about how to do kind of exactly what you just described, which is how to get standard errors on the the confidence set, on the identified set. Mm -hmm. Right? And you can think about am I trying to estimate the boundary or am I trying to estimate the set itself? Mm -hmm. And that affects how you think about the standard errors, right? <coughs> And so we've had, they got displaced by guys studying housing, but there was a period where it seemed like every job candidate was studying exactly that question. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a new standard error for set identification? Now they're all studying housing markets. So you can imagine the answer to that, you know, the reason for that. <laughs> Other questions? All right, quantile treatment effects. So quantile treatment effects are actually related here. Uh, I think Scott mentioned these, at least they were, they were mentioned quickly in one of his slides. I want to say a bit more about them. So quantile treatment effects just say, all right, I'm going to take the difference between outcome quantile in the treated distribution and the outcome quantile in the untreated distribution, which is called quantile treatment effects. And typically you would do them at every percentile or every fifth percentile or something like that. When you do that, you get a graph that looks like this. Let me talk you through this. This is figure one from Hackman, Smith, and Clement. So these are data from this experimental evaluation of a job training program it's called the Job Training Partnership Act, JTPA. That's not so important. The outcome variable here is earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. The horizontal axis is percentiles of the outcome distribution. So 30-30 here means the 30th percentile of the control distribution and the 30th percentile of the treated outcome distribution. The vertical height here is the, dis the difference between those two percentiles. Right? So what do we learn from this graph? First of all, you will note that we are zero from the first percentile through about the 20th percentile. Why is that? Remember, these are earnings in the 18 months after random assignment. We're subtracting the control percentile from the treated percentile. For the first 20 percentiles, those numbers are all zero. Why is that? I have a list of names that I can't cold call. Yes? Both control and treatment, you know what? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So in these data, so these are for adult women, ages 22 and above, in the treated group, uh, about 20% of the women have zero earnings in the 18 month after random assignment. They don't work. They do get transfers, but this isn't transfer. This is earnings. About 23% of the women in the control group don't work. So here we're taking zero minus zero, and we're getting zero. Then this thing moves up to about 800, and it's kind of remarkably flat, actually. If you were an aficionado, if you were a fan of the common effect model, the common effect model looks pretty good from the 20th percentile to about the 90th percentile. And then it, it ramps up for whatever reason. People at the upper end, well, for whatever reason, quantile treatment effects are larger at the top of the distribution. And so that's, you can get these very easily. We didn't realize it when we wrote this paper. We go through this fairly complicated estimation procedure based on a book by a guy named Zorgo. It turns out that we could have just said Q rec and theta. And that would have saved us a lot of time and effort. But we sort of didn't. We hadn't made, when we wrote this paper, the link between the quantile treatment effects and the quantile regression. We're the only variable on the right hand side of the quantile regression, just the treatment indicator. But that's where you can get these in state of very useless by just doing Q reg, Y, D, comma and then the particular quantile that you're interested in. That's not what we do in this paper. Okay. That's the mechanics, that's pretty simple. What's not so simple, perhaps, is understanding the meaning of those quantile differences. And what I want to emphasize here is that there are two ways to interpret them, and those two ways to interpret them depend on the assumptions that you are willing to make. So the least assumptions 
and say, okay, I'm not willing to assume anything about the joint distribution. I'm just interested in the effect of different quantiles, right? Let's suppose that what I'm interested in is inequality, right? So what I want to do, say, is calculate the Gini coefficient of the treatment group marginal and the Gini coefficient of the control group marginal, something like that. And this is fine. This is what I need to know. But let's suppose that I'm interested in the distribution of impacts. If I'm interested in the distribution of impacts, so f of delta, as I said before, where delta is y1 minus y0, then I might be willing to assume rank preservation. That's what they're calls it. I might be willing to assume that the counterfactual for the 40th quantile in the treated units is the 40th quantile in the control units. Right? That is an assumption about the joint distribution. Right? That's assuming a rank correlation of one. That assumption allows me to say that this effect, this difference, is the treatment effect for these units. Right? If I don't make the rank preservation assumption, I just know here's the marginal, here are the quantiles of the treated distribution, here are the quantiles of the untreated distribution, but I don't know which quantile of the treated units goes to which quantile of the untreated units. If I assume rank preservation, then I do. I know that the quantiles match, and I can interpret this as a treatment effect for these units, and this is a treatment effect for these units. So I've described that as impact on quantiles versus impact at quantiles. That's leaning pretty heavily on the English, which worries me here. Uh, so I want to make sure that I describe it more generally. This is not assuming rank preservation, right? We can still estimate quantile treatment. They're still interesting for some purposes. This is assuming rank preservation, and when I assume rank preservation, I now have impacts for specific units. And so I can calculate the impact for every unit, and then I can look at the distribution of impacts and its features. Costs and benefits. You make more assumptions, you get more stuff out. Right? It's just like structural estimation. More assumptions, more stuff comes out. The game, of course, and it's not really a game because we're actually going to make policy recommendations that people might take seriously, but if we use this term loosely, the game is making assumptions that are plausible. Right? And they're plausible because they come from economic theory, they're plausible because they're based on things we know about the world, institutions, prior empirical work, whatever. It turns out you can test an implication of rank preservation. This is very clever. This is one of these, these things. Sometimes you know you pick up a paper and you start reading, and there's there's some result that is obvious once you read it, and it wasn't obvious before, and then you're really frustrated because it's it's obvious. You think, ah, I could have written that paper. I could have had that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it! They had it first, and that's really fun. Uh, that's worse than that. Yeah, there's nothing worse than that. Uh, you know, uh, Levitt has that paper about real estate agents having different incentives than you do and setting the price for your house. Mm -hmm. I, I, this is even worse. I had exactly that thought when I was going to my condo in London, Ontario. And I thought, somebody must have written a paper about that. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple years later, Levitt writes a paper about that. And he was in touch with was like, oh, <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> We've all, we've all been there. I know, I know, I know. It's not an uncommon situation. Anyway, um, so Joan is my former colleague from Maryland, who's now a, a law professor at Penn. Quit, he resigned his tenure job at Arizona to go back to law school and kick some butt on the law school market. Now, and Hillary is my intellectual cousin. It's very advice and advice. Anyway, very nice paper. And their intuition is that if rank preservation is true, if rank preservation is true, then the baseline characteristic of people at the 30th percentile of the treatment group should look like the baseline characteristic of people at the 30th percentile of the control group. And that should be true for every percentile. Basically, you should have covariate balance at percentiles if rank preservation is true. And they develop in the in this MBR working paper where you can. There it is. In this NBR working paper, they develop and formalize a test of covariate balance at quantiles. So that's, that, that, is, that is not a test of rank preservation, it's a test of an implication of rank preservation, which is to say covariate imbalance, 
Covariant imbalance implies rank preservation is false, but covariant balance does not imply that rank preservation is true. It's just consistent with rank preservation being true. But that's still very nice. This test is not widely used, and, and even worse, the published version of this paper, the editor made them take the test out, which I thought was the best bit of the paper, but obviously the editor disagreed. Questions so far? Remember what, what my, my plan is here. We talked about experiments, we introduced the notation. I noted that experiments only give you the marginal. That's true standard non-experimental methods as well. And I want to talk about, well, suppose we're interested in parameters that are not identified by the margin. What can we do? We talked about the fresh hopping bounds. We talked about quantile treatment effects, assumptions you can make, namely rank preservation. The next thing I want to talk about is so-called random coefficient model. So a random coefficient model, and I have to have an equation here, I suppose, they don't. So in simplest form, like that, what's the difference between this and what we usually write down? The difference between this and what we usually write down is that the beta, the coefficient on the treatment indicator, has an I subscript. And then this strand of literature, the random coefficient literature, goes on to assume that beta di is independent of di epsilon. All right, so there's heterogeneous coefficients. The betas have an I subscript. But we're going to make a really strong assumption. We're going to assume that the value of this thing is independent of treatment status and of the error term. So once you're willing to do that, this is assumed in fact and correlated with the untreated outcome, right? The untreated outcome here is just beta naught, which is the same for everyone, plus epsilon i. Then you can go wild, right? How many of you have heard of HLN, just out of curiosity? Anybody in the room know what HLN is? Okay, HLM stands for Hierarchical Linear Models. So hierarchy, you would have heard of when I say that. Um, but to its aficionado, it's just known as HLM, or sometimes MLM, which I always like to make the connection to multi-level marketing, uh, which also is called MLM. <laughs> the economists have a, a somewhat derivative relationship with HLM, as it turns out, for reasons I will try to explain to you. But HLM is really popular in the education literature. And the idea is, suppose that we want to study the effect of a treatment on students, and we think that, but it's a treatment that takes place at the school level, or the classroom level, let's say the classroom level. So the classroom level of treatment is new mathematics curriculum. In a hierarchical linear model, you have two equations. You have an equation for the student outcome, and you have an equation at the classroom level. And you can think about HLM, and it's very useful. I think it's very useful actually pedagogically because it forces you to think about these different levels, and it forces you to acknowledge the fact that the treatment is happening at different levels of the outcome. It is also a way to get the standard errors right, which is something that economists were slow to do in that kind of context. But along with HLM, oftentimes is random effect assumptions, uh, where we're assuming heterogeneous coefficients. I think that's good. I think most treatments have heterogeneous effects but they're assumed to be independent of everything else in the model. That makes estimation easier. We can assume, for example, that this is normally distributed and this is normally distributed. Then we can estimate this by maximum likelihood. Simple, simple as can be, very straightforward. We can assume a flexible parametric form for this and estimate the parameters of the flexible parametric form. Or we can do the wild. We can pretend to be electrical engineers. We can do non-parametric deconvolution. You get this. We do this in Heckman, Smith, and Clements. It's not at all obvious to me. I probably shouldn't admit that, that those numbers mean anything in the uh, numerical deconvolution exercise in Heckman, Smith, and Clements. We had to do a lot of smoothing to get them to look possible, which is not very attractive. Anyway, some sausage factor restored. Uh, the other numbers in there, I'm all completely happy with. My problem with this is this assumption. So tell me a model, a 
of a voluntary treatment in which this is true. Right? Well, I think the basic characteristic of a voluntary treatment in which the treatment effect is uncorrelated with treatment status is going to have to contain the notion that the individual agents have no idea what the treatment effect is. Right? Because if the individual agents know what their treatment effect is, they're going to select into treatment based on the treatment effect. Right? Well, if an individual is selecting the treatment based on the treatment effect, this is false. And I think, I think it's almost always false. So this strand of literature is a little bit of a, it's not a, I guess puzzle is not the right word. I understand that people like simplicity. People want to be doing heterogeneous treatment effects. They want to do it in an easy way. This is an easy way to do it. This is a high price. Because it's difficult to think of context in the step tend to be true. At least for voluntary treatment. That, that's not the only reason why that would be false. I suppose you go to a model of kind that you know, we talked about yesterday where you have this where the epsilon kind of comes in from a random utility component. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So yep. the individual we know is on the utility. Mm -hmm. right? No, it, it, you would tell lots of there's lots of reasons to think this and this being independent are is also implausible. I was sort of emphasizing this and this. Right. Uh, Maybe the treatment effect works better for people who have bad epsilon. Mm -hmm. Or the treatment works better for people with bad epsilon. Right? There's lots of stories you can tell in particular contexts along those lines. Okay, so I don't like those, but that's another way to get at it. Um, so again, big picture. We're going too slowly, so that's always true. <coughs> Sometimes we're interested in, or we might be interested in, or perhaps the literature should be interested in frame this normatively, features of the treatment effect distribution that we don't normally consider, right? Things beyond the means, things that require the joint distribution of outcomes. How are we going to get that? One way is to confound it. We can just be satisfied with the map, right? Let the map tell us. Some, that does provide some information. That's nice, right? Maybe we're willing to go a bit further. Maybe we're willing to assume rank preservation. And we can do more. We can spin it down exactly, but that's a strong assumption. And we can test an implication of rank preservation, but it may not be that powerful to test. Now, in Heckman, Smith, and Clements, I'm not going to go through it here. We do another exercise where we assume uh, values for the rank correlation. Right? And so we have a whole big table where we sort of say, all right, if the rank correlation is 0.2, what kind of distributions of impact do you get. Now, assuming the rank correlation is something besides 0 or 1, does not give you point identification. It gives you temp identification. And we don't attempt to actually characterize the set other than by Monte Carlo. We draw from the possible distributions of impacts with rank correlations of 0.2. That was very fun for me. So some of you know I was a computer science major as an undergrad, in addition to an economics major. Uh, when I got hired by Heckman, and my income went way up, I bought this uh, you yeah, understand it's complicated <coughs> I bought this set of famous books by Donald Knuth, which are kind of the, the, the old testament of computer science, if you will. Uh, and the only time I ended up using those books in my research was for this paper, for this exercise of drawing distributions, giant, drawing joint distributions with a particular rank correlation. It turned out there was an algorithm in the books that was useful for doing that, which is really cool. It also turns out that I discovered an error in my initial program in mid-November, the year I was in the job market. And those of you who know about the economic job market know that you like to send out your job market materials in early November. I discovered this error in mid to late November. My stuff wasn't out anyway, and it didn't end up going out until early December. So that was an intense period. You got a job. I got it. It all worked out. All right. All right, so random coefficient models, we talked about the strategy about sampling conditional and rank correlation. Now I want to sort of step back and head down a bit of a different path. And we're going to go down a couple other paths about capturing heterogeneity and treatment effects. So the thing that the literature does do is it does do subgroup effects. So it estimates separate impacts as a function of features of the units, right? So men and women. Do men and women have different impacts? Do people on welfare have different impacts than people not on welfare? Do minorities have different impacts than majority group members? So on and so forth. That kind of information is very useful for targeting and statistical treatment rules. Chuck Ward here, yep. Chuck writes a paper saying that you should always do this. 
should always investigate subgroup impacts and report them in a serious way. Uh, Jabari and Smith make a distinction between what we call systematic and idiosyncratic variation of treatment effects. So we define systematic variation of treatment effects as variations accounted for by observed features of the units. Idiosyncratic variation of treatment effects is what's left over. It's a variation of treatment effects that is not accounted for by the observed characteristics of the unit. Obviously, this notion is data set dependent. Right? If I observe some additional characteristics, then I'm going to pick up some more systemic variation, and I'm going to lose some idiosyncratic variation. When we do this exercise with bounding the variance of the impacts, that was, that was bounds ignoring all covariates. Right? So just taking the treated outcomes, the untreated outcomes, and assuming we have only idiosyncratic variation. Idiosyncratic variation isn't actually very helpful in a program operation sense. Systematic variation is potentially helpful in a program operation sense. We know the systematic variation, and we can do targeting, we can do statistical treatment rules. If we just know that there's a lot of idiosyncratic variation in the treatment effect, that says, that's a measure of our ignorance, right? And says, oh, this treatment effect is really heterogeneous, but we don't know why. Thus, maybe it's a spur to research. I'm going to argue later on that a really important omission in the literature, not a complete omission, but a near complete omission, is theories of systematic variation in treatment effect. So that we know what to measure, right? Suppose we did a study, some important treatment. We randomize, we get great data on outcomes. We estimate subgroup effects. We don't find much there. But we estimate the lower bound on the variance of the treatments. I talked earlier about how to do that. Right? We test to know whether there's a common effect. We reject it soundly. The lower bound on the variance is huge. What do we do? Well, what we need to do is we need to think hard about what's going to account for the variation of treatment effects. So the next time we do this, we can collect data on those variables and actually characterize the variation as a function of those variables because then the variation becomes useful. So Butler, Gilbach, and Hoyne have a recent paper so recent that I have not actually had a chance to read it. But it is, so you can see they're working along this line, which I'm very enthused about. And they are starting on a, they're working on a question that John and I actually talked about working on when I was back at Maryland, which is trying to kind of decompose the variance in the treatment effect into systematic and idiosyncratic variation, and how to think about doing that. And that's what they do in their new paper. It's self-recommended, even though I haven't read it. They're very clever guys and gals. So. <clears throat> All right. Are subgroup effects structural? We didn't get to talk about types yesterday. I like to tease structural people about types. I think types were implicit in the discussion a bit at the end. Uh, when Kevin Stang, uh, my colleague Kevin Stang, was a student of David Card's and David Card's structural period. Uh, when he gave his job talk at Michigan, I asked him, he had types, I asked him if the types were structural. Uh, he said nobody ever asked that question before. Anyway. This is a little bit different than that, but this question is, are the subgroup, are the subgroup effect structural? So let's say I run an experiment, I get my data, I run a regression of the outcome on a treatment indicator, the treatment indicator interacted with a dummy variable for being male, and I find that there's a difference in the treatment effect between men and women, and it's big, let's say. Is that structural? Right, and what I mean by structural is, if I mucked around with the process by which people select into the program, would that difference still be the same? Right? So if I mucked around with the structure of the participation process, and we're going to look at this critique again here, right? I mucked around with that, and I did another experiment, same treatment, different process of selection to treatment, would the population difference in the effect of the treatment between men and women be the same? If it's the same, that's not really about structural. There's just some difference between men and women that leads the treatment effect to have to be different between men and women. An alternative notion is that there is within group treatment effects heterogeneity, and in particular, participation regimes are going to draw in people from each group 
from a different part of that treatment effective solution. So I came up with a very simple and obviously, you know, kind of Fuji example here, but it makes the point. So let's suppose that half of men have an impact of 10, half have an impact of 4, half of women have an impact of 12, and half have an impact of 1. And let's suppose I've set up my program so that the cost of participating is 5, and let's suppose that everybody knows their impact. Well, who's going to participate? These men and these women, right? So I do my experimental evaluation of the program in that regime, and I'm going to estimate a subgroup difference of two between men and women in favor of women. And I'm going to say, hey, this is great. This program works really well for women. I don't know why, but it works well for women. So let's change the program and subsidize it to get all the rest of the women. OK? Well, that's a waste of money, right? The program really costs five. We don't want to be bringing in people with an impact of one. This, this is a social loss, right? There's, and there's, and there's two issues here. The first issue is averages are different than margins, right? And that's sort of independent of several things, right? Even if there were only one group, if we think about expanding this program, we would think if people know their impact, that as we make the program easier and easier to get into, the people that we get in that come in are going to have lower and lower impacts, right? It's a simple economic model of participation in which individuals know their treatment effect, right? As we move around the cost of being in the program, we're going to move around the marginal person in terms of the impact. The average impact on the treated is going to be a very bad guide in many contexts to the impact on that marginal person. The second issue here is that that distribution of impact is different in the two groups, right? And so the subgroup impact difference among the treated is not a good guide to the subgroup impact difference in the untreated. So in my little example here, the treatment effects, the subgroup effects are not structural in the way I have defined this. Right? They are, I find them, they're real, but they're not structural because they're not invariant to the participation regime. This is something literature does not think about at all. Yeah? If it's a random assignment, yep. that would be structural. Not if it's a voluntary program, right? So what I have in my head is like this job training program in the US. You're not required to take it. You can take it if you want. Some people show up and they take it. The people who randomly assign are the people who show up and say, I want to take the program. Right? And then I have in mind here that I can muck around with who shows up to take the program. And if I do that in this example, I'm going to change the mean difference in impact to the minimum, so not structural. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah? I'm sorry, I still don't find a statement. You should not be so, sorry. Uh, not structural in the, in the sense that it's a big time mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, uh, let's say you do the random, random. Uh, think about uh, even thing. random, it still cannot be considered as a structural, because those, those is the, the, the next. Total impact is not really the, the parameters of the, the problems function. Well, if you think about medical treatment, right? If there were a difference, think about sickle cell disease, right? Sickle cell disease is important for some demographic groups and not for others. And you might have a treatment for sickle cell disease that works well for one demographic group and not for others for reasons that are biological. So it wouldn't matter which part of that demographic group that you treated, as long as they all had the same biological difference, the treatment effects difference between that group and the other group. That's what I have in mind about structural. I mean, in a sense, you could say, well, what's really structural here is this distribution, right? It's not the main difference that I estimated on this in my experiment. It's the underlying distribution. I'm fine with calling that structural. That's your question. The issue is that people tend, sometimes in applied work, people get all excited about differences in treatment on the treated and interpret them as if there are also differences in the effect of treatment on the untreated or on people at the margin. And no, that doesn't have to be true. Um, and before you get all excited about basing your statistical treatment rule on impact on treatment treated, you need to think about margins and averages and blah, blah, blah. So I want to proselytize, excuse me, I'm going way too slow. That's okay. In favor of models of heterogeneous treatment effects. I think the literature is seriously missing these. I don't think we've actually heard a little bit about them this week. 
So this can be a model that is about subgroup effects. It can be a model about quantile treatment effects. So on Wednesday, we heard from Mark. Why I, I read Mark as telling us about a model of differences in the treatment effects between males and females. Right? It was a model actually that sort of was not about heterogeneity in the treatment effect within these two groups. It was about differences between the two groups and the sort of structural <coughs> subgroup impact differences, if you will. I thought that was pretty cool. I really liked that part of Mark's talk. I did that as a model. His model is a model for models that the rest of us should be doing in other contexts to think about where subgroup differences might come from. So after this talk, I spent a bunch of time thinking about what model do I write down. There's a long-standing finding in the US literature that job training programs work better for women. Nobody knows why. There's no model. I think I have a model in my head. I'm going to see if I can talk to my research team and to work on it with me. So real effects from teaching this course, perhaps, on my research effort. This is a very rare thing in the literature. So another paper I like here is these guys again. You can tell I really like these guys. Using guys in the standard economic sense, by the way, meaning both men and women. Uh, kind of these two are women. They have this paper it uses data from an experimental evaluation of an intervention in the way that the welfare program for single mothers works in the US called Connecticut Jobs First. You can actually get these data if you want, they're commercially available. It's a tiny little form and promise to behave. So they're looking at quantile treatment effects. They're in the quantile treatment effects. And they write down a very simple kind of labor leisure model that shows that the design of the Connecticut Jobs First treatment implies different impacts at different quantiles of the distribution. And then they test their theory by looking at the quantile treatment. I think it's a beautiful paper. It's one of my favorite papers the last 10 years. They write down a very simple model of energy and treatment effects, not by not by subgroups from the usual sense of X, but by quantiles of outcomes. And then they test the model on the quantile human effects. It's really nice. Nice paper. I highly recommend it. This is something we should be doing more of. Just last week, I saw a paper at, uh, at Madison. We had a conference at Madison last week that I was actually co organized. Uh, this is Pat Klein from Michigan, now at Berkeley. This is Melissa Takari, who is an intellectual sibling of Alfu. And they all see the Connecticut Jobs First data. And they go a bit farther. So they're, again, thinking about this notion of the joint distribution of outcomes and the way to put restrictions on the joint distribution of outcomes. And so they write down a theoretical model that allows them to essentially zero out portions of the joint distribution. Say there shouldn't be anybody here. If our model holds, if our economic model behavior of these welfare women holds, then certain parts of the joint distribution shouldn't have any probability mass. And then they look to see the extent to which those restrictions reduce the, the, uh, the set of possible treatment effects parameters that are consistent uh, with the model. So this, this is beautiful. I haven't had a chance to read the paper. I've seen it presented. I thought it was very cool. I was very excited. These are both very smart folks. I was excited to see them working on this. So I'm off. I know a lot of students in here, right? I've been trying to hand out paper ideas. When you reach a certain life stage, you've got a list of paper ideas in a file on your computer. That list is longer than the time to cap T. So you just start giving them away. Uh, when somebody writes a paper I was going to write, I say, who off? Cross it off. You now I can do something else. So huge opportunities for research here. And this is part of the general point, and I was, I have to say, I was very pleased yesterday with Xiao Fu's presentation because I thought it emphasized the fact that there's real, there's compliments. It emphasized the fact that what you want to do in terms of the style of your empirical work depends on the question you're trying to answer. And I think that's really true. I suppose it's a good lesson. I would add that there's many, there's many cases where design-based empirical work and theory are complements, not substitutes. And I've been trying to emphasize that in this presentation. I've used the word theory lots of times, because I think this is a literature not that should be thrown out. 
Right? I think design-based empirical work is very useful for answering certain questions. We need to understand the limits of what it can do. But it is also very useful to complement theory. So that's what I've been trying to push today. I know when I had lunch with some folks yesterday, which is why I missed uh, Scott's talk, unfortunately, somebody asked me, oh, you know, is, there, is structural work out of fashion now? In fact, the reverse is true. Structural work has come back into fashion. But I think that phrase, fashion, should be a clue that there's trouble here, right? That we should not be choosing our style of work based on fashion. We should not be choosing structural work so that we can show off our ability to do complicated mathematics, right? <coughs> if we're a serious discipline, we should be choosing the style of work we do because it's the right choice to answer the question that we're trying to answer. So, I, I was, in fact, before, the, before this course started on Monday, I was thinking, well, this is a funny set of faculty to have brought together for this purpose. Uh, but actually, as the week has gone on, I thought it worked really well, uh, the set of people who were brought together. So, anyway. Yeah? Can I add something to what you said? Yeah, please. And this, is, this is based on my experience running a research seminar for third year graduate students, uh, uh, where lots of empirical work is presented uh, at Cornell. And one of the things that I've learned is that it's a really good idea sometime near the beginning of the work to actually think about what the question you want to answer is. Oh, no, 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 no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no because I can only muddle your thing yeah. together, really. <laughs> it's just, it is just amazing to me, right, how yeah. often, right, the question kind of changes in process, but the techniques that are being applied don't change to match the evolution of the question. Right? And, and it, you know, it's fine if the question changes in process because it means that you're learning stuff along the way, right? But, but you know, there you are, you've got the tools all set up to solve problem A and you end up solving problem B instead. And what you've done is you've taken the hammer to your screwdriver. Right? Yeah. And, and, and that's a really common, common, common thing. So this I, is a great moment, right? Yes, this. and this is, this is a very good student in RSP stick on asking this. What's your question? And if you can't say what your question is in a way that your mom would understand, then you need to stop and think it's about. Job what interview question number one. Oh yes, yes, and then you need to stop and just spend all your time figuring out a way to explain your question to your mom. And then when you can do that, then you can go forward again. Because uh, you can't understand if you don't understand your question in a way that's clear enough to explain to a non-economist, you don't understand your question. All right. Um, so I'm getting well. All right, we'll stop for a break shortly. So, another thing that's been on my mind lately uh, is partly because I was the external reviewer on this guy's dissertation. This guy is a PhD student at the University of Cape Town. And I agreed to this as a very important thing to learn is that professors have to say no, and I'm not very good at it, it's just problematic. Uh, so, I get an email you know, from the University of Cape Town, which you can do this guy's dissertation, right? So it's a couple days of work, and they're paying three hundred and sixty dollars, which is not very much money for a couple days of work. And I feel guilty because my I have students from South Africa, I have colleagues who are South Africa all the time, and they've been bugging me for nine years here in South Africa, and I never have. And so, because I felt guilty about that, I agreed to be the external reviewer of this guy's dissertation. Some sort of karmic balance will be restored. <laughs> Stupid reasoning, right? But it turned out. To my surprise, his dissertation is really good. Uh, so actually, ex post, I don't regret it too much. Uh, and one of the things he wrote about is this question about sort of site slash context effect and external validity. So this has become a big issue in the literature on randomized controlled trials. It's not limited to that. It's an issue with non-experimental evaluations as well. It's an issue with any sort of work. But it comes up particularly in randomized controlled trials. So, Suppose that we tried out, so I was on the technical working group for uh, an experiment, an experimental evaluation of random drug testing of high school students. Right? So they randomized the amount of random drug testing. And the only schools that would participate in this were in the south part of the US. Right? So this is an evaluation funded by the US Department of Education. Uh, we're a bit freaky about, about drugs in the US. And uh, so we have this random randomized drug testing of high school students if they want to be on that team. 
So now we've got experimental about, we have experimental impacts, we have them for a different school districts. So they randomized schools within school districts. They did a kind of block design, right? So they took districts that had multiple high schools. We randomly assigned the high schools within districts to treatment and control states. And we can get district specific impacts. Suppose we find, which was not true, that it had big effects on drug use. And we'd like to scale it up to the rest of the country. How do we do that? Well, the problem is that the South is pretty different than the rest of the US. And so, if you just said, oh, well, obviously these results from the South, everyone goes to church, and blah, 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 there's all these other different things, we can just port those right over to Nevada, and no one goes to church, right? You think, like, well, you might change this whole going to church thing, might interact with how you work with drugs and stuff. Well, that might be impossible. So people in literature have thought a bit about how do we go about looking at external validity and thinking about external validity, right? We've done an experiment that's correct to implement. We have internal validity. We have compelling causal estimates of the impact of the treatment at the places where we did it. But if we're going to scale up, we want to know, is it plausible that those impacts apply to the places where we did not run the experiment? And if we randomly chose schools in the US and ran the experiment at the random sample of schools, we would have a strong case for external validity. But the fact of the matter is that the way these things work in the US, the Department of Education can't just randomly pick schools and make them participate in evaluations. They have to get volunteers. And those volunteers often come differentially from the South, partly because teachers unions are less strong in the South for lots of reasons. Then we need to think about how do we generalize stuff. And I'm focusing on side effects here, but the same thing applies to individual characteristics too. It's just that with individual characteristics, right, typically in evaluation, we have a lot more individuals than we do sites. And so we may do a good job of covering the support of individual characteristics. We may not do a very good job of covering the support of site characteristics. So a lot of this discussion takes place in the context of site characteristics. This paper here by Hutz, Imbens, and Mortimer which is drawn on a lot by Muller in his dissertation, kind of lays out what you can do if you believe that the site effects are just a function of site level x's. Right? So if I know characteristics of the sites, the ones that are relevant to the heterogeneity of the treatment effect, it would be helpful to have a theory of treatment effect heterogeneity to do that. But if I know that x's at the site level that are relevant to the heterogeneity of the treatment effect, then I can just reweight my impact using the distribution of site level x's in the country as a whole to get an external an estimate of the impact of the programs we did it in the country as a whole. Right? What does that depend on? So here was the argument. Suppose, suppose that I believe that I know the characteristics of the sites that matter for heterogeneity in the treatment effect at the site level. Right? So I can estimate how the treatment effects in my experimental data vary with that site characteristic. And then I can reweight the distribution of impacts as a function of XS using the distribution of XS in the larger population. And that gives me an estimate of the impact of the treatment in the larger population. What's the key thing that I might have trouble with? And this goes back to Jocelyn's lecture yesterday. I might have trouble with the support condition, right? So if, all my, if, all the, if the X I think is important is what fraction of kids go to church every week, and I only did this in the South, then I may not have any observations. I may not have any experimental data for schools where not very many kids go to church. But there may be a lot of those schools in the country as a whole. So I have a support problem. Right? I have an extrapolation problem. In order to solve my extrapolation problem, yeah, I either, either I had to design my experiment differently, right? If I thought about this ex ante, it's always good to think. It's actually always good to think. Thinking is, is remarkably powerful. But if all of you who have ever taught a class know that thinking is also very costly. And if you, if you thought about this in advance, you would say, oh, I'm ultimately going to want to scale this up. I better make sure to sample some schools to cover the full support of the XS that I think are important, even if I need to maybe drive them to be in the experiment to do that. But if I didn't do that, I'd be stuck, 
right? Unless I'm willing to make some sort of linearity assumption, right? I can say, oh, well, the treatment effect increases linearly in the fraction of kids who go to church. And I can estimate that slope using the data of excess between 0.6 and 0.8 and project it down to excess equals 0.3 out of the sample. Some people might believe that, some people might not. Another issue to think about in terms of how you see uh, fishing. Let's talk fishing and then we'll take a break. Quick break. We were talking about this the other night too, actually. The slides that, were, that are about things that we talked about various evenings this week are mostly new. Uh, so, another issue that's come up as these kinds of evaluations have become more common people like to find that treatments work for somebody somehow. And so people will, you know, they've done their experiments and they've collected a lot of baseline data on individual characteristics and they will interact the treatment indicator with each of the individual characteristics for us to make subgroup effects on schooling and gender and race ethnicity and previous earnings and this and that. And they report all these in a big table and they do a separate t-test for each of these estimated subgroup impacts and then they say, oh, well, look at this. It's true I estimated 100 subgroup impacts, but good news, five of them are statistically significant at the 5% level. <laughs> <laughs> Hoorah. That's a problem, right? That's what I'm calling fishing. Right? You're sort of, you keep looking at more subgroup estimates until you find some subgroup which the program appears to work, and then you highlight that in the executive summary of your experimental report. Uh, people have caught on to this though, and so the literature has started to move in a couple of directions in relation to this issue to try to kind of put the foot down on fishing. One way that people have put the foot, foot down on fishing is that, and here I'm kind of thinking mostly about the U.S. Department of Education, but their work has had an influence elsewhere, and some of their work actually drawing on things from the development of Pre-commission is the thing number one. You have to say before you look at your data which subgroups you think are most important. They're called confirmatory. They're called confirmatory because you're supposed to have a reason for thinking that there will be a subgroup impact on this dimension. Maybe that reason is previous empirical work, maybe that reason is theory, but you need to have a reason. And there's kind of a norm that the number of these subgroup things are pretty small. Four or five. And then you can, you can do all the fishing you want afterwards, but it has to be in a separate section that's called exploratory. And these things are not taken as seriously. They are viewed as providing potential motivation for becoming confirmatory subgroups in future evaluations. Right? That's one way that you take sort of this pre-commitment so that everybody understands exactly what your fishing process was. Number two, there's a statistics literature on what's called the multiple comparisons problem. So when you're doing a lot of classical statistical tests, right, you do 100, you think that five of them are gonna be significant at the 5% level, even when they're all actually zero differences, there's ways to adjust the p-values from the test when you do multiple tests to reduce this sort of false positive problem. You may have heard of the von Fraunhofer correction, that's one very conservative way to do this. There's a more recent, somewhat less conservative, scheme called Benjamini and Hochberg that worries about something called family-wide error rates. There's a very nice survey of this whole literature. One of my friend Peter Souche, also my intellectual sibling, one of my two students from his time at Yale, uh, who works for mathematical policy research. He wrote a nice survey paper for the National Center for Education Evaluation, which has been happening in 22 of your that covers this whole issue of multiple comparisons. But some of the economists have started to pay attention to drawing from the statistics literature that they never really paid attention to before. The third thing people do, and this is kind of the poster child or the poster children for this, uh, are cling, leave, and caps, still alive as it turns out. Um, I didn't like this, so I didn't um, This is a paper about the Movies Opportunity Project that somebody mentioned the other day. It had this issue of kind of a zillion million outcomes, and so these folks, who are well known economists from the sort of Cambridge crowd, thought about this problem. And their suggestion 
which is a good suggestion, was to reduce the number of outcomes by combining outcomes into indices within substantive domains. Right? So in MTO, there were sort of employment-related outcomes, there were crime-related outcomes, there were psychological-related outcomes. Instead of looking at 15 employment-related outcomes, they suggested create an index of employment-related outcomes, a one-dimensional index, by combining the individual outcomes, and then look at impact on the index. Right? So you reduce the dimension of the number of outcomes you're looking at from 10 to 1, in that example. In so doing, you have greatly lessened problems of multiple comparisons. At the same time, you have increased problems of interpretation. Right? That's the cost to that benefit, you know, pretty much, as we like to say in economic terms. All right, what have we been doing? We talked about experiments, we talked about heterogeneous treatment effects, we talked about parameters related to heterogeneous treatment effects that depend on the joint distribution of outcomes. We talked in a little bit of detail about two strategies for getting those, bounding and random coefficient model. We talked in no detail about trying estimates conditional on rank correlation. Then we talked, we switched gears, and we talked about heterogeneous treatment effects that are a function of observed covariates. And talked about external validity in that context, talked about dividing between systematic and idiosyncratic treatment effect heterogeneity. And then we talked about the problem of fishing that often arises in practice when evaluations are looking at subgroup effects in large number. I want to switch gears again, talk about something else you might do with experiments. So the Journal of Economic Perspectives paper that Heckman and I wrote that was published in 95 is paired with another paper uh, by Larry Orr and Gary Burlitz. And it's, it's, it has a lot of sites. I think it has a lot of sites because people teach out of it, and I think people teach out of it because there was this notion that Burlitz and Orr was in favor of experiments, and Heckman and Smith were not in favor of experiments. And that's not how I think about it. Uh, I think we, I think Burlitz and Orr emphasized certain positive features of experiments. I think Jim and I emphasized certain limitations of experiments that were not at that point widely enough understood in the literature. Excuse me. Some of those things have become better understood in the literature, like the fact that you have to make assumptions about experiments too. Other things still not so much. What I want to argue in this slide is that one of the most useful things about experiments is that you can use them to provide a benchmark for non-experimental estimation of effects of treatments. Right? And you can think about that in, in both literature, if you will. So one of, another one of my favorite papers uh, of the last 10 years is this Todd and Wolfen paper in the American Economic Review. It also uses data from the progressive experiment. So aside the fact that these kind of high, these gold-plated expensive experiments that attract a lot of attention, like Progressa, is that they generate these really valuable data that people then go on to use to, to generate other knowledge. And I think that this knowledge generation aspect of experiments is often undervalued by the people who fund experiments. Maybe in some cases the most valuable thing to come out of an experiment may not be the evaluation itself, but the data uh, that gets used for other things. Anyway, so my intellectual sibling, friend, and co-author, Chow Fu's advisor. This is an incestuous little literature. That's another point I'm trying to make implicitly. Uh, economics is a small world. The little, little individual literature is tend to be even smaller. So what do they do? They, they take the control group, the progressa, you might remember, is basically a program that pays people to send their kids to school in rural Mexico. And they take the data from the control group, these are control villages, and they use the control group to estimate a dynamic, structural, discrete choice model of fertility and child labor supply. And fertility schooling. So schooling is kind of one line flavor supply. Right? They ignore the treatment group. They cover their eyes, say, ah, suppose that we only had the control group, suppose that we had observational data, we would estimate this structural model. And they do that. 
Then they take the structural model, right? This is the big selling point. I'm sorry, Chapu is outside. Uh, this is the big selling point. The structure is that we can solve the extrapolation problem, right? They're using the control group. There's no progressa in the control group. But they've estimated structural parameters, and now they're going to introduce progressive into the model and simulate the effect that progressive would have. Right? So they're simulating outside of the data, they're extrapolating, using the deep structural parameters that they've estimated in the control group. Then they compare the simulated effects of progressive from the control group plus the structural model to the experimental effects of progressive estimated by simply comparing the treatment group to the control group. Right? This is a test of the ability of their structural modeling strategy. No, it's not a test of all structural models. It is a test of their structural model, but it is a fairly standard model from the literature related to, but more complicated than what you saw yesterday. To see how well the structural model did. That's really valuable. Right? That's really valuable. Now, it's kind of a glass half full, half empty sort of thing, it turns out. Uh, I'm told that Petra was pretty surprised <coughs> at how well the structural model did. Um, and if you notice, her work becomes more structural after this. I think in part because she sort of says, oh, this can actually do something, right? It can actually match data. Uh, how, how cool is that? Oh, this is a very nice paper. You have to have, right? It's, it's using an experiment for another purpose. It's using it to evaluate the structural model. That's kind of cool. Now, they could have done something different, right? They could have used the treatment group not to test the model, but to help identify the model. And that's a choice you always face. So I have one of these papers, I'll mention it later on, and we face the same decision. Do you use the treatment group to help with identification, or do you use it to help with testing? And it's always a hard choice. At least you have the choice. Some of you may be familiar with this much broader literature. I think I put some of this on the, on the uh, reading list. This is the literature that uses experiments to study the performance of alternative, non-experimental identification strategies and estimators. All right, and one of my current hobby horses, one of the current things I like to complain about is that people are not careful to distinguish between an identification strategy and an estimator. So we're going to spend some time, not as much time as I had imagined, talking about matching and weighting estimators. But we're going to talk about estimators that assume that you can solve the selection problem by conditioning, right? by conditioning on some set of X variables. That's an identification strategy, right? just like Creating randomized variation with an experiment is an identification strategy. Or assuming bias stability so that you can do difference and difference is an identification strategy. In the lecture, second lecture, we're going to talk about four different estimators, four different classes of estimators that all assume selection on their variable. We're going to talk about parametric regression. We're going to talk about matching in the sense that statisticians use that term. We're going to talk about the broader thing called matching that economists use, and we're going to talk about weighting. Those are estimators. They're estimators that all assume a particular identification strategy. This literature is confused about the difference, particularly this paper, uh, is confused about the difference between identification strategies and estimators. That confusion carries over to the adhesion law papers. Right? So this is a very famous paper. It has like a million, billion types. It uses experimental data from an experiment called the National Supported Work Demonstration in the US. It says, oh, the same deal as these guys, right? We cover our eyes and say, suppose that we hadn't run an experiment. Suppose we just had the treatment group and the non-experimental comparison group. We subject them to non-experimental evaluation. We run regressions, we do different things. We do the Heckman two-step estimator. Although we get it wrong, so you should ignore those results. And then we see, do the non-experimental estimates that we get with the treatment group and the comparison group match the experimental estimates that we get with the treatment group and the control group from the random assignment? That's what this paper does. This was the first paper to really do that strategy. There's now a giant literature of papers that do that strategy. 
This paper, so this is Robert Lawn to Chicago, who's on my dissertation committee again, <coughs> little tiny incestuous world, um, came to the conclusion that the non-experimental estimates didn't match the experimental estimates, and therefore we should do experiments. And it was as a direct result of this paper that the Job Training Partnership Act experiment, which was what I, the data I used for my dissertation and for which that is used in all the Techman et al. papers, that experiment was the result of a long paper. And so real consequences there. The adhesion lava, so these guys are students in part of Josh Anger, again, a little tiny that's this world, uh, at MIT, they do matching on the long data. And they are able to get estimates that are closer to the experimental estimates, although which are gigantic standard errors, which are not emphasized. But they too confuse what they're doing between testing identification strategies and testing estimators. I actually have a whole separate one of that stock of lectures I talked about is a lecture on just these three papers and the many lessons that can be learned from them. Smith and Todd come along and, and basically poke at the heat and lava and show that if you poke at it, it collapses into a heap of dust. That's how I would describe this. But at the same time, they also, I think, clarify but not entirely clarify the issue about estimators versus identification strategies. So I have a paper going on now with a student where we go back to the support of work data again, recreate the data from the very beginning, so we redo everything the LAN did. Both these papers use the LAN data set. For men, the data set for women has been lost, it turns out, because at some point he put the tape near a magnet. Things that happened in the past. Uh, we've recreated the data on women. Uh, so anyway, expect more papers on that for me. But this is a very valuable use of experiments, too. We have learned a lot. So I would frame this literature as learning about the plausibility of particular identification strategies in particular substantive contexts. So if we're doing selection and observe variables, you'll learn about which variables you need to condition on. If you look at the Heckman et al. econometric paper, the 1998 paper, one of the key results in that paper is if you condition on only the variables that the Hughes and Lava have, you don't match the experimental impact of JPPA. If you condition on a richer set of variables, you do. That's important knowledge. It's knowledge in a very kind of crude, reduced form sense of what variables do I need to collect if anybody's going to believe my non-experimental evaluation strategy. It's also important knowledge about the underlying economics, although I don't think it's been exploited as much for that purpose. That's another place where there's much work to do. You know, I've said to some of you at meals and things like that, there's an important stage that you pass in your career when the Paris resources and ideas at the time. Tons of ideas. All right. This is the penultimate slide, I believe, the next to last slide in the first lecture, and here it is only 11. Uh, general equilibrium evaluation. I think this is really important too, and this is another area. This list is almost all the papers, which is kind of astounding in some sense. Uh, so, general equilibrium evaluation tries to get to relax the SIPA assumption to say, well, what happens if Programs have effects on people who aren't treated. Yes. So I thought that there was a three associated with this, and I heard that there was a couple of papers that I don't have not read. So, uh, but I'm, and I can't recall what they are. But 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 three of this would be would be looking for uh, peer effects and social network effects. And and I think that Chuck, for example, has written on on, on treatment with peer effects. That's fair, actually. That, and that's that's actually not only fair, but a good comment worthy of being written down. <laughs> Thank you. Now that's, a, that's a really good. I I have not played much in the career effects literature. I've had a couple students play in the career effects literature. Uh, but you're right. There should be a three different effects. I am not so uh, I tend to think about this stuff in more of a searchy kind of way. Mm -hmm. right. So think about labor market programs training program or job search assistance program that trains people to better look for work, how would we evaluate such a program, right? If you think about a standard search model with, say, endogenous search effort, then a program that leads some agents to increase their search effort, maybe we reduce the cost to them of search effort by making them better searchers, 
that's going to change the optimal search effort of everybody else in the labor market. Right? So a simple search model with endogenous search effort says that a program, and many of these programs are designed explicitly to affect people's search effort or their search cost, that such a program is going to have external effects. And if you don't look at those external effects, you're not going to get the effect of the program like that. Well, how would you evaluate a program like that? Or suppose you had a training program that increases the skills of some people. Right? Well, that's what's that going to do? If you do enough of that, it's going to change the skill price. If you change the skill price, that's going to affect the decisions of other people to invest in that skill or not. Right? How are you going to evaluate that? Well, there's two main strategies in literature. One strategy in literature is to take isolated labor markets and subject them to different amounts of the treatment. Right? So you need, you need isolated labor markets if you want to keep the spillovers within the labor market and not across the labor market. Right? So Angelucci and Giorgio is, again, using the progressive data. So Angelucci is my colleague at Michigan. Uh, D. Giorgio is her friend from graduate school at UCL. They're looking at the Progressa data because what would happen in Progressa, right? Well, suppose that Progressa works. A bunch of teenagers go to high school instead of working. Well, that's going to change the price of labor, right? And the the villages relative to the control villages. That may change the price of tortillas, right? That may have effects on untreated households. And so it turns out very cleverly, the people who designed the progressive experiment, remember randomization is happening at the village level, these are remote rural villages in Mexico, and they collect the data in each village not only on people eligible for progressive, but on people not eligible for progressive, which is very cool. And so you can look for spillovers by comparing, by looking for treatment effects on the ineligible people. Right? Now they do much more than this, they actually have a whole structure where they're trying to look at the mechanism by which treatment effects in the ineligible come about. It turns out they come about through family networks. They, I think by mistake, were given the file containing all the names of everybody. And so they were able to trace out family networks using the names. Very cool. Another of my favorite papers of last century. This one. Uh, this paper, a paper that only Esther pull off. This is it. The famous Esther Buse photo. Oh, look at the journal. <laughs> Put that aside and note that I was a referee here. So I, I know where I might talk. This is a good paper. You know, to, to quote my advisor, just because it's in the QJE doesn't mean it's any good. Yes, I, under, I understand that. But this is actually but a conditional paper. Answer. It doesn't mean it's bad. No. It just doesn't mean it's good. Right. Yeah. This paper it is so cool. And the fact that they managed to do it in France is even double cool. So the French government picked local labor markets, and they did two-level randomization. So they randomized at the individual level. With each local labor market, they randomly assigned a job search treatment to unemployed people. Okay. Across labor markets, they randomized a fraction of the unemployed people who got the job search treatment. Right. So now you can get a general equilibrium effect by looking at how the, the individual level treatment effect estimated in each labor market varies with the fraction of people in the labor market, remember that fraction is randomly assigned, who got treated. Right? This is about as good as it gets in terms of design-based going after a general equilibrium effect. This is pretty cool. The other strategy, the other line of literature here is literature that writes down an explicit general equilibrium model, usually some kind of search model. So this is my former colleague, George Johnson. It turns out he was working on the exchange when I was in high school. As we learned yesterday on Wednesday when Mark was in third grade. Uh, this is Davidson and Woodbury, these guys up in Michigan State. They wrote down, they were interested in a treatment called the UI bonus. The UI bonus said to unemployed people, if you get a job within 10 weeks, we'll give you a $500 check. And that turned out to have impacts the first time they did it, they did it the second time and the fourth time they did it. These guys used the data, they write down the search model, and again, it's just like the story I told at the beginning of the slide. If we get these UI guys in the first 10 weeks of their spell to search really hard, that means everybody else in the labor market 
should not search as hard because the return to search is now lower for them because some of the jobs they would have found in the absence of the UI bonus experiment will have already been taken by the guys who are searching harder because they're incentivized by the bonus. And so they argue using their calibrated search model, I know calibrated is kind of a dodgy thing, using their calibrated search model, that 70% of the partial equilibrium effect goes away in general equilibrium. That's a big difference, right? That's enough to affect the cost benefit calculation for this program. Now, that's all conditional on you believing the search model, but absent this, this is as good as it gets. Heckman Lockner Caper, I mentioned this paper the other day, another one of my favorite papers in the last 15 years, I guess now. Um, they write down, and I know Larry doesn't like these, but dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of people's decisions about going to college or not. Right? So there's a high school labor market, there's a college labor market, people are choosing whether or not to go to college. The, what the policy they examine is a college tuition subsidy. And the mechanism they're interested in is changes in skill prices. So the idea is, if we put on this subsidy that reduces the price of going to college, a bunch more people go to college. That changes the relative supply of college-educated and high school-educated labor. That changes the prices, right? Well, changing the prices has a feedback effect into your decision to go to college or not. And they argue that 90% of the partial equilibrium impact goes away in general equilibrium. The ones who take account of endogenous skill prices, the number of people you get to go to college with a subsidy is only 10% of what you thought it was if you didn't take account of skill prices. So that's a substantively very important difference that again could easily change a cost benefit analysis of that policy. It's a beautiful paper. It's also a paper that embodies you know, four person years of work. <laughs> Those two person years. <laughs> yes. It, it's very interesting. You talk, about, you talk about the cost and benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, one quick question is that so, how the subsidy is financed? If it's the subsidy is financed through the, the increasing tax, yep. then it actually will go. So, 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 how is it? Is a, is a, so, how the cost is, is incorporated? My recollection is that they built the government budget constraint as a model, right? And that's a, <clears throat> you know, we're discussing this a bit at the break. In, in a sense that there's this notion of closing the model. This is a phrase that macroeconomists use. It's not really a binary decision. Usually it's really more of a continuous thing, right? There's sort of always things you can keep adding to the model to capture more aspects of the world. Some, mac some models of this type ignore taxes, right? This program comes from nowhere, somehow it's financed. That's not really good, but these models are oftentimes operating at the edge of what is sort of computationally and mentally feasible to understand. And there's a trade-off between trying to do everything and not actually having control over what you're doing in either a computational or a conceptual sense. But my recollection is that these guys have taxes in the model, which that's good, obviously. So, so the tax also in, uh, has another impact on the non yes. Yeah. Right. But it's been a little while since I read it, so I wouldn't support that. I think the probability is probably that they have taxes in the model, just knowing the way Jim operates. Uh, this is Miana Pleska. She's a student of mine. This is the Journal of Human Capital. She does a general equilibrium evaluation of the employment service, which is the job matching function of the US government. Uh, it's a very nice paper. I took this was her job market paper, and she was on the job market in 2000. And Four. <laughs> I got this a very long time to get this thing published. Uh, but it's a very nice paper at the end of the day. And then this is my paper, uh, Lee Sykes and Smith, 2004 NDR working paper. Someday we may publish it. <laughs> uh, it's got a, a long history of the journal. I didn't know that it has over 100 rule sites as an NDR paper, which is very nice. Uh, so in some sense, it's not why well, it's not broken. But uh, And this is Shannon, this is my student from Western. Jeremy is your student, so he's not an experienced student. I'm into these academic genealogy things, but I think they explain a lot of variations. Uh, anyway, this is a lot of the papers, putting aside the Fairfax literature, which is vast. I did a ton more to do here. Uh, and I think these are very powerful. And again, your, your right, this, this paper here is using the self-sufficiency project, which is another experimental evaluation. And we're doing something along the lines of what Todd and Wolpen do, except with a search model. 
right? We, we calibrate our search model in the world without the SSP program. We predict using the calibrated search model the effect of the SSP program in partial equilibrium, because that's what we get out of the experiment. We do pretty well at that, it turns out. And then we unleash the search model in general equilibrium. It's the same idea. Should we use the experiment to help us identify the search model, or should we use it to help us test the search model? We opted with testing in this context. All right, summary conclusions from lecture number one, which is consumed two hours and two minutes. Uh, this is a phrase from my buddy Bert Barnell, labor economist. Experiments are not a substitute for thinking. That is perhaps the key lesson. And, it, and you know, a lot of what bugs the people who um, are unhappy with, with random assignment literature, so I know Scott talked about this yesterday, the sort of anti-randomistas, <coughs> the, uh, the Angus Deatons of the world, people like that. And Angus is somebody that I think is wicked for the school, uh, actually, uh, is the fact that sometimes when you read experimental evaluation papers, it does seem like the experiment is being used as a substitute for thinking. And part of what I, the point I tried to make in this lecture is that actually experiments, thinking and doing an experiment are complements, not substitutes. Um, point number two, there's a lot of stuff to look at besides treatment on the speed and the average treatment effect, right? Energy and treatment effects, I think, are substantively important. Right? I, I wish there were more evaluations that tested the null of the common treatment effect, but every case I've seen where the null was tested, it has been rejected. Right? And I think that is evidence of substantive importance of treatment effect heterogeneity. Figuring out how to capture that heterogeneity, right? to turn it from idiosyncratic to substantive, to systemic treatment effect heterogeneity, so we can use it to target programs and things, that is a big wide open I argued that thinking about models of treatment effect heterogeneity is a useful way to try to get at that enterprise. And I interpreted one of the two papers that Mark presented on Wednesday as doing exactly that, presenting a very nice example of a theory of treatment effect heterogeneity <coughs> showing how it was useful for policy. Several so effects and side effects, not as simple as they might seem. Finally, gender program effective programs are under study. Any other questions about lecture number one? A lot of stuff. Lecture number two is a bit more focused. This has a, a little bit of a big themes, greatest hits kind of aspect. All right. That's the way that's made. So there's like 50 slides here, so we're not going to do all these, but they will be circulated and you will have them. So I'll try to kind of hit the high points. So, this is this is going to be a more applied econometric talk, so economics is kind of just going to sneak in from time to time. Uh, so I'm going to consider estimators that one would use if one is going to assume selection of unobserved variables, and I'll talk more about that in a second. I actually have a whole 90-minute lecture on justifying the assumption of selection of unobserved variables. It is something that we do not do very well in economics. Uh, you've heard a little bit from Scott about what I think of the the three types of people in the world. There's people who think that selection on observed variables is always true, that no matter how rotten your data set and no matter the context, miraculously, the benevolent identification deity has provided the variables that you need so that the conditional independence assumption is true. There is a set of people who believe that selection on observed variables is never true. Those are, those are common in economics, actually. Some of my friends are in that group. And then there is what I think of as the preferred third group, which is the group that thinks that selection of observed variables is sometimes true, and that one can and should make a systematic, thoughtful case for it being true in a particular context using the institutions and economics of the situation. It's pretty clear which view I think is right. All right, so then we're going to talk about the four ways to implement selection of observed variables, the four classes of estimators parametric linear regression, matching, if it's thought about in the statistics literature, non-parametric regression estimators, which are sometimes called matching in the economic literature. I think that is my fault. I think if I had it to do over again, I would not cause that to happen because it causes a lot of confusion. And then weighting estimators, which uh, are the current do get in this literature. And I think we're going to have time to do a little kind of a big picture view of those things. 
I don't think we'll get to any of this stuff. We might get to the annual selection. All right, basic assumption. Selection on observed variables in a linear regression context, right? Some outcome, some conditioning variables that are exogenous in a particular sense, treatment indicator, the I subscript is mysteriously, mysteriously disappeared for the moment, but it will come back, and the error term. The error term, of course, is every other thing that affects outcomes. That's how I like to think about it, right? It's called the error term for historical reasons. We might even call it measurement error if we want to in certain contexts. And usually there's some measurement error in there, but that's usually not what it mostly is. What it mostly is is X's that are not in our data set, or X's that are in our data set and that we have chosen for some arbitrary reason that we haven't thought very hard about not to put in the regression. There's a whole strand of very interesting literature now about the case where the dimension of X is greater than the number of observations. So this is called the P greater than N literature. We had a student on the market this year in econometrics who wrote their dissertation on kind of importing, expanding, and improving some of the literature from statistics on P greater than N into economic land. Uh, but this is a problem, right? If you have more variables, you can't put all P variables in if there's more of them than N because the matrix won't invert. And so you have to do something to reduce the dimensionality of the set of overage you're actually going to put in. Economists tend to do that in an ad hoc, informal way. Uh, statisticians tend to do it in a mechanical, a theoretic way. Neither of those is ideal. Uh, one of the nice, one of the things I emphasize when I talk about selection unobserved variables is the value of actually thinking about which variables you decide to include. Or even better, if you have control over the design of the data collection, which variables you decide to collect data on. This is why I always say selection on observed variables instead of selection on observable variables. Because in the longer run, what's observed is endogenous, right? It's a choice variable for researchers in part. And I think it's important. We often, the literature is often very loose to selection on observables when what it means is selection on observed variables. Same thing with unobservable and unobserved. Observing is a good strategy for solving selection problems. Go observe more stuff. The choice of what to go observe should be guided by the economics of the problem. Uh, so these things, again, complement, not substitute. So in matching, the matching world, this is usually written this way. So y0 is independent of d positional on x. This is what you need for treatment on the treated. If you want the average treatment effect, you need y1 over here. There's a bunch of names for this. I'm going to mostly say selection on observed variables today. I used to mostly say conditional independence. I don't know why I changed. Statistician used this awful word, unconfoundedness, uh, which always struck me as horribly awkward. And sometimes they also use the word ignorability. This has been ported into economics by Eminem by and his students and friends. But I just don't like the word, so I don't use it. Uh, and you know, having four words for the same thing is a barrier to entry. And of course, barriers to entry help people are salaries higher. So there we go. All right, what does assumption mean? The conditional defense assumption, or, or select on zero variables, means the treatment status is random, conditional on some set of variables. This is a really strong assumption. I don't want to minimize that in any way. I think it's usually not true. Uh, in this sense, so I mentioned these questions on the zero variables, is analogous to an experiment. So, what you're going to do, what matching is trying to do, matching estimators, is to mimic an experiment in the following sense, right? If I do random assignment, the distribution of covariates is balanced between the treated and the untreated units of the random assignment. Not just the observed covariates, but all the unobserved covariates as well. What matching seeks to do is to mimic that by balancing the distribution of observed characteristics and then assuming that that's enough. Right, that there aren't lingering unobserved characteristics that have not been balanced that are going to cause trouble. And that's a case that needs to be made. And as I mentioned, if we have another lecture this afternoon, I would be happy to regale you with my argument about how to make that case. Because we don't have that, I will encourage you to read papers by my friend, Professor Dr. Mikhail Lechner, because he does a good job of this. 
of justifying the conditional dependence assumption in particular substantive context. So you need to have all the acts that affect both, not either, but both participation outcomes. Sometimes you'll read people say, oh, we need all the variables that affect participation. That's not true. In fact, you don't want to do that because all the variables that affect participation are going to include some instruments. They're going to include variables that affect participation but not outcome. You don't want to condition on those. We'll talk about that more perhaps later on. Again, very strong assumption. 99% of papers do a very bad job of motivating it, of justifying it in light of the economics and institutions of the particular context. There's lots of room for improvement here. All right, we talked about that. So economists tend to do this and this, especially this lately. It's become fashionable waiting. Uh, you may have heard of local linear matching. That's what's done in, in mathematics from Smith and Todd. Economists tend to use these two. Bad decisions tend to do this. I guess and lots of people still tend to do that. This, these tend to be the cool kids methods. This in statistics, this in economics. I'll talk a little bit about the end, and I'll probably jump ahead to that slide, about the little literature that tries to indicate when you want to do this versus when you want to do this versus when you want to do this. That's an important question. All right. <clears throat> I'm just going to say this and not spend time on this slide. But it's something that oddly sociologists know better than economists. I'm not sure why. And that is that if you're in a world with heterogeneous treatment effects, and you simply do OLS, and you don't include interactions between the treatment indicator and X's, and there are in fact treatment effects that vary with X, then the S demand is not treatment on the treatment. It is a variance weighted, it is this thing here. That is not treatment untreated. That is a weighted average of subgroup specific treatment effects where the weights depend on the probability of treatment, the variance in the probability of treatment in the subgroups. Who knows what that means? I mean, it means something. It's just a coherent parameter. You can write this out. I'm just taking this from the angle from the history book. It's not treatment untreated. So there's a whole literature, and again, we'll talk about this towards the end. Well, actually, we sort of already talked about it. Like the one paper that compare, or the even well papers, they compare estimates from OLS to estimates from matching. Those estimates are different, right? It's different. Because matching estimates treatment untreated, OLS in heterogeneous treatment effects world does not. So if you look at those two numbers and you say, well, this one's different than that, it may not be that OLS is bad and matching is good. It may just be that these two estimates are actually different. And that those methods are good at estimating their particular estimate. Right, that's a minor point. So let's think about matching. What I'm going to spend the next few minutes doing is kind of talking about how we get propensity for matching. So the simplest thing you might do with matching is you might say, let's just compare people with exactly the same values of the conditioning variables that I think are important to satisfy selection on certain variables. So immediately you're going to say, wait a minute, what if one of those variables is continuous? We can't do exact matching if one of those variables is continuous. Because if it's really continuous in the mathematical sense, we'll never have two people with the same value. Now, in fact, economists use continuous to mean variables that are discrete but have like more than 10 values. Uh, and then we, uh, it's all kind of a mess. Uh, that's fine. Let's suppose that the variables are literally discrete. But this, if we had generally continuous variables, this would be problematic. And we'll say more about that in a second. So let's say that x takes on 10 discrete values, 1 to 10. How would we implement selection of unobserved variables? Well, what we would do is we would take each value of x from 1 to 10, and we would take the treated units of that value of x, take their mean outcome, and compare it to the mean outcome of the untreated units of that value of x. That gives us a value of x specific treatment of x. And then we could take weighted averages of those value of x specific treatment effects to get either the treatment on the treated, which means we would weight them by the distribution of x among the treated units, or the average treatment effect, in which case we weight them by the distribution of x in the population. So this formula here is a very exotic and complicated way of writing what I just said. So let me explain. So N1K is the number of treated units that have x value k. 
this thing here, this is the sum over k of m1 k, this is the total number of treated units. This is the number of treated units that have x equals x of k. So this is doing this weighting to get treatment of the treated. Right? This ratio is the fraction of the treated units for whom x equals the case value. This thing in square brackets is a very complicated way of writing the difference in mean outcomes between the treated units with x equals xk. Right? So this says i equals k and di equals 1. di equals 1 means I'm treated. i is an element of k means that x equals xk. I sum up the y's and divide by the number of treated units with that value of x. Right? So this is just y bar for x equals xk, written to make it look complicated so that you can charge more in your consulting practice. Similarly here, one second, this is y bar for the untreated units with x equals xk. So for each k, this difference, remember there's a summation over k up here, for each k, this thing in square brackets, is just the mean difference in y between the treated units of that value of x and the untreated units of that value of x. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you can use uh, x uh, to, to, to match the, a subject from two groups. Yep. Uh, we can also use x as a control, yep. not doing the matching. Yep. So, so, so which one is better? We're going to talk about that later on. Right, so I'm not going to say a ton about parametric linear regression. Uh, it's going to be mostly kind of working in the background as the implicit alternative to all these matching and weighting estimators. But you'll you'll see as we go along what my thoughts are about that. Okay. So this is just some, this is cell matching or exact matching, if you will. That's really nice. What's the problem with exact matching? So is this clear to everybody before I go on to what the problem is? Simple as can be. If we only need to match on one discrete x or three discrete x, we can create cells. We match exactly on the x, that's really nice. We're really imposing our assumption. We take x specific impacts, then we reweight the x specific impacts, get treatment untreated, or average treatment effect. We'll move over. If any, if any, well, nobody knew who Gary King was, somebody asked that the other day. Gary King has a scheme called CEM for Corson's exact matching. And basically, his idea is that you should take your, you should take your data and discretize it so that you can do this. Right? That's what the course name means. You take your, your Y with 50 values, you compress it into bins, so that there's a small enough number of them that you can kind of do this with reasonable intervals. All right, but the problem here, the problem here is cursive dimensionality. Now, Chapman did not use the term cursive dimensionality yesterday. <coughs> It is a term that is also used in the literature in dynamic three choice models, although it is a term that has a different meaning in that literature than it is here. So in that literature it refers to the fact that if you have a lifetime of 60 periods, and each period you make a binary choice, that the number of leaves in the tree defined by that sequence of binary choices is very large. And a computational burden is going to result because that dimensionality of the choice tree, if you will, is very large. Here the issue is that if I think I need to condition on a whole bunch of discrete x, right? Suppose I need to, I think that selection on observed variables is satisfied if I have five variables with each of three values that I condition on. That's not very many. Now of course, the point is not how many variables you condition on, but condition on the right ones, although you wouldn't always know that from reading the literature. This is an example. Suppose I needed five variables, each of which take on three values. That's 243 cells. Right? If my data set is in sort of, you know, a thousand treated units, a thousand untreated units, that's not a small data set. I'm going to have empty cell issues. Right? I'm going to have cells that have a treated unit and no untreated unit. What do I do with that? When I go to when I go to calculate this, if I have a cell with treated units and no untreated units, this is missing. What impact do I assign for that cell? That's not attractive, that's the, but that's the curse of dimensionality. The solution, in quotes, to the curse of dimensionality is that we're going to develop alternative estimators that don't require exact matches on X, that only require inexact matches on X. So amazingly, the next slide is called inexact matching estimators. So we deal with the curse of dimensionality, so these empty cell problems, by trying to figure out compelling ways to compare people who are not exactly alike, but are kind of alike. 
So we're gonna, we're gonna reduce the dimensionality of F, that's how we're gonna do this. And then we're gonna compare people along this reduced dimension. So there's two popular ways to do this in the literature. There's really only one popular way to do this in literature and economics, but in the broader literature, including statistics, there's two popular ways to do this. The one that economists don't use is Mahalanobis distance dimension. So how many people here know what the Mahalanobis distance is? Oh my goodness, Mahalanobis is a famous Indian as an Indian Indian statistician. The US has to say, clarify that, say that you clearly don't mean Native American. Uh, Mahalanobis is a famous Indian statistician. And he came up with this notion of, it's basically the distance in standard deviation units taking account of covariances and covariances. So if you had five variables, they're all independent, the Mahalanobis distance, would, you would just standardize each variable, okay? Take the distance in standard deviation units in each dimension and add them up. That's the Mahalanobis distance. The nice thing about the Mahalanobis distance is it gets away from scale issues with Euclidean distance, <coughs> right? If one of your control variables is earnings last year and the other one is a binary variable for something, you don't want to just add those up, right? Because earnings is in thousands, the binary variable is zero or one. You want to rescale those things so that you're not putting all the weight on the continuous variable and none of the weight of the binary variable. So, my how I know this distance, you can figure out, you have some treated units, you have some untreated units. You can calculate the Mahalanobis distance between each treated unit and every untreated unit, and then match it this is the statistical sense of matching, match it to the units with, with the, the untreated unit with the smallest Mahalanobis distance. Right. That's single nearest neighbor matching, which we'll talk about more exactly in a second, using this as the distance metric. Right. This is the issue here. We're going to do this in exact matching. We have to pick a metric. We have to pick a, we have to dimension reduce our axis into a single dimension and then look at distances on that dimension. The Mahalanobis distance is one way to collapse multi-dimensional x into a one-dimensional scale. Distance in standard deviation units adjusted, adjusted for covariance. The other way that's common in literature to collapse multi-dimensional x into a one-dimensional scale is propensity score matching. PSM, you've heard a bit about this yesterday from Scott. The magic of PSM. I want to, I want to, I want to be like the Wizard of Oz a little bit with PSM in that I want to move the curtain aside so you can see the guy with the levers <laughs> and be a little bit less perhaps enthralled about PSM than you might have been before. At the same time, the point here is not to denigrate PSM. I want to illustrate what the sense to it is, but it's not magic. Right? If you read the applied literature, especially outside of economics these days and fields where PSM is going through the same kind of faddish aspect that it went through in economics in the 90s. Look at the sociology literature, look at the science literature. There's a real confusion in that literature that seems to suggest that people believe that somehow, by doing PSM, I'm no longer assuming selection on observed variables like I was when I was running the OLS regression. Right? It's not buying anything in that. The assumption is slightly different but the substance is pretty much the same. We're assuming we can get rid of the selection problem by conditioning on stuff. What propensity score matching is gonna buy us, or matching of any sort, is something else, right? Same identification strategy, different estimators. Different estimators have costs and benefits too, mainly in sort of statistical terms. I already talked about one difference, right? The matching estimate is treatment untreated. The regression estimate, if you don't include interaction, is that variance weighted treatment point number one, that's nice. That point goes to matching, I think, because they've got the estimate that we usually want. We'll talk about several other differences between what matching does and what parametric linear regression does in the way that it's usually implemented in economics, which means putting all the x's in as main effects and then stopping. Right. Okay, so what's the propensity score? Propensity score is just the probability of your treated given x. I'm going to call it P of x. And these guys wrote it down to Rubin. So Rubin also had a hand in the Hesian of Wabbit dissertation. Uh, again, my own little thing here. Uh, he and Mr. Heflin are not best friends, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> I was once accused, uh, Jim once accused Lechner and I of creating Rubinoids in our course. 
That's his, his, his name for, uh, for followers of who knows. Anyway, yes, famous people can act. <laughs> Somewhat non serious at times. Okay, so Rosen and Rubin, 83 paper that tells them it has a million, billion sites. They show that if the conditional independence assumption holds for X, then it also holds for P of X. So you can think of that as P of X summarizes all of the information in X relative to this selection problem. All right? And so the idea here is oh gosh, we had trouble with X because of the curse of dimensionality. But now we can just match on P of X. It's a scalar. And now it, not only is it a scalar, it's a scalar that's only between 0 and 1. And we're going to match on P of X, and that solves all our problems. Isn't that wonderful? What's the intuition here? The intuition, this took me a long time to figure out. The intuition is that two groups that have the same propensity score always have the same relative proportion in among the treated units and the untreated units. So in my graduate applied econometrics class, I go through a long example. I don't have time to go through here with bikers and hikers. Bikers and hikers have different y zeros on average, but they have the same propensity score. And if 90% of the, of the population is bikers and 10% of hikers, if their p score is the same, then they're going to show up. There's going to be the same proportion of bikers among the treated units as there are bikers among the untreated units. And so any systematic difference in their y zero balances between the treated and untreated groups, conditional on the propensity score. That's why it's okay. It's sort of it's sort of telling you it's okay to pool the bikers and the hikers for the purposes of calculating the treatment effect. Because they're balanced because they have the same probability of treatment. Happy to send you the pleasure. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Wow. All right. We solved the curse of dimensionality by doing the propensity score. So now I want to estimate the propensity score. Let's say that I try to estimate the propensity score non-parametrically. I like non-parametrics. What happens? Crash. I run into the curse of dimensionality again, right? Okay. This is part of this pulling away the shroud from the Wizard of Oz. I guess I'm mixing metaphors there. Uh, pulling the curtain away from the Wizard of Oz, right? We say, oh, we solved the curse of, dimen curse of dimensionality problem by using a propensity score, but we really haven't, right? Because if we try to estimate the propensity score non parametrically, how are we going to do it? We're going to take x values, and for particular exact combinations of x, we're going to calculate the fraction of units that are treated. Well, we can't do that because of the curse of dimensionality, right? That's why we went to the propensity score, but so we didn't have big enough samples. So that for every combination of x, we had treated units and untreated units. So in fact, the propensity score does not solve the curse of dimensionality. What the propensity score does is it pushes it from the level of the outcome equation to the level of the participation equation or treatment equation, where it is solved by adopting a parametric model such as logical approach. So propensity score estimation is a semi-parametric estimation method. We're going to estimate a parametric propensity score model, if we use it or probe it, and then we're going to run implicitly a non-parametric regression on the estimated propensity score. So we're combining parametric propensity score model with non-parametric regression of outcomes on propensity scores. That is a semi-parametric estimator. Now, because of the joy of theoretical parametrics, if we are willing to make a promise that as our sample size gets bigger, we make our logic or public model increasingly flexible, but not too quickly, then we are fully non-parametric. If that comforts you, that's good. So this is kind of jab at Renzi score number one is you're not really solving the curse of dimensionality in any deep sense. You're pushing it back to the propensity score, and then you're solving it by adopting the parameter. I have this line here. This is thin. You could, you could write papers on this. You would take um, This is the great empty point in this literature is why is this better than just being flexible about the outcome equation and the progression? There's not a lot of papers that show that it is. Uh, something on my list. But you could write it first, because I'm very slow. <laughs> um, all right. <coughs> what have I got left? <laughs> Twelve minutes. OK. Um, don't worry, we're just going to solve this stuff. Um, so
So there's a lot of different matching estimators that statisticians think about that. So there's single nearest neighbor matching, non-cell pair matching, with and without replacement. So this is a kind of matching. So now let's think about propensity scores. So we've estimated propensity score. We have a p-hat for everybody. For each treated unit, single nearest neighbor matching says, take the untreated unit with the propensity score, the estimated propensity score, that is most similar to that of the treated unit, and match them with them together. And we can do that with and without replacement. If I do it without replacement, that means that each untreated unit can only be matched to one treated unit. If I do it with replacement, each untreated unit can be matched to multiple treated units. There's a bias variance trade-off in there. There's always bias variance trade-off when you're doing non-parametric. Doing that. Once we've got the propensity scores, we're now going to be non-parametric, even though we estimated those parametrically. There's something called optimal matching without replacement. This is something only statisticians do. So this is, this involves a lot of computation. Basically, you consider all matching without replacement is order dependent. If you do it in all possible orders, you can figure out the ordering that gives you the smallest average distance in propensity scores between the treated and untreated units. That's called optimal matching. My colleague at Michigan, Ben Hansen, he studied with Rosenbaum <coughs> and Dominic Rubin. He had something called optimal full matching, which you can use when the treated and untreated groups are different size. You can have multiple matches. I think Thomas tend to think this is this is nuts. Or we can discuss at lunch if you want, but it's 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 cool in the in the statistics literature. All right, here is the general form. This is from Smith and Todd, 2005. This is the general form of matching estimators. This is useful. I got to pick and choose now. I don't have much time left. <coughs> so n1 is the number of treated units. So we're taking an average over the number of treated units. Sum that is i the di equals one. That's telling us we're taking this average over the treated unit, the di equals one unit. The thing in square brackets, the first element is the treated outcome for the treated unit. Right, the observed treated outcome for the treated unit. What is this? This is a sum over the untreated unit, so j and dj equals zero, of a weighted outcome of untreated unit j. Right, so the thing in square brackets is the difference between the observed outcome of treated unit i and a weighted average of untreated units j where the weights depend on i and j. So think about single nearest neighbor matching, right? Where we're picking one untreated unit to match with each treated unit. In that case, wij is always one or zero, right? If you're the nearest neighbor, if your unit j is the nearest neighbor of unit i, this is one. If you're not the nearest neighbor, this is zero. Other matching schemes, this may be non-zero for more than one observation. So this is the general form that encompasses all the estimators. All you're doing always is you're taking a difference between the treated unit and some weighted average of the untreated unit. And all the matching estimators in the literature differ just in how this weighting function is calculated. And there's reasons in particular context, and we'll use this <coughs> given the time available to prefer certain weighting functions to other weighting functions. All right, wait up to add one, that's not surprising. Blah, blah, blah. All right. So what I want to do now, and this is this is the newer part, but not so much in the literature, mm -hmm. and not really all the way in Smith and Todd, and that's part of why I want to write this additional paper uh, using the supportive work data as we go through this. So Hackman, Schubert, Smith, and Todd talk about something called local linear matching. What is local linear matching? Local linear matching is picking the weights by running a local linear regression. So let's think about that. Any questions? So I'm not I'm not very good at graphics uh, for the slides, so it's good to have a little white stuff here. Okay, so. This is propensity score, estimated propensity score, the end of x, this is the outcome. So I have some untreated units. That, they can't have propensity scores higher than one. Okay. 
And then I have, let's say, for the moment, because I'm cluttered, I have a treated unit. Right? Nearest neighbor matching. What does nearest neighbor matching say? Nearest neighbor matching says, so let's call this x1. Here's p cap 1. That's the estimated frequency score for treated unit 1. Nearest neighbor matching says, find the untreated unit with the nearest p cap. Can be above, can be below. Pick that. It goes into the formula. Oops. It goes into here with a little work on The way the Heckman Hachimura split and pod technique, again, unfortunately perhaps called local linear matching, says is what we're going to do is we're going to run a local linear regression to give us those weights W. Okay? So what is a local linear regression? So it's a linear regression, except it's a weighted least squares regression where the weights are proportional to the distance away from the estimated propensity score of the treated unit. So for treated unit number one, we run a weighted regression. These are the weights for <coughs> regression of y zero j on p hat x sub j. All right, so the j is again the untreated units. So we're using the untreated units to estimate a local linear regression of y zero that's what the untreated units experience on p hat. And then we're going to take, essentially what we're doing is we're taking the predicted value from that local linear regression, evaluated at p hat 1, and that is this term. Okay. So we're estimating linear regression, but it's a local one, because we're defining these weights so that these observations that are far away aren't going to play any role in picking the slope coefficient. So that's a standard, right? This is standard stuff. And if you pick up Pagan and Ula, or Lee and Racine, or any of the kind of standard textbooks on non-parametrics and economics, this is just a standard non-parametric regression. We're getting the estimated counterfactual for each unit i by running this non-parametric regression of y0 on p hat using the untreated units, and then taking predicted values from that non-parametric regression. This is this is great. Why is this great? Because this is great because economists want everything to be a regression. And now we have taken matching and we have framed it as a regression. That's being a little facetious, but I think this is actually important because sometimes in the literature, matching is portrayed as being something very different from what we have done in the past, and it really isn't. Right? Even nearest neighbor matching, right? Any smoother, right? So this is what the non-parametric regression literature talks about. It's smoothers. It's way of, of estimating this relationship between y0 and p hat of x without imposing a parametric assumption. You do that using smoothers. Local linear regression is a smoother. Nearest neighbor is also a smoother. Histograms are smoothers. Or actually regressograms right now, are smoothers. Kernels are smoothers. Splines are smoothers. Right? These are all techniques for running non-parametric regressions, and we can think about defining matching estimators in the broad sense that that term is used in economics, using any one of those standard non-parametric techniques to estimate the non-parametric regression of y0 on p hat of x, and thereby to obtain predicted values to put on the right-hand side of this term. Right? So you can think about matching, either as economists do it with local linear regression, or as statisticians do with nearest neighbors as just an application, just an application of non-parametric regression. It's not so different. What does that mean? That means that all the stuff we know from the non-parametric regression literature, which is voluminous, even though very few applied papers actually use non-parametric regression, I think, unfortunately, there's a voluminous theoretical econometric literature. And it tells us a lot of stuff. Right? We don't have to regenerate new, new econometric stuff for these estimators, it's already there if you think about them as applications of non parametric regression. Okay, that's one of the messages I want to get across. Let's see what else I want to say before we run out of time. Inverse propensity weighting. Very nice. Uh, dates back to this 1952 Jazz paper uh, by Harvest and Thompson. Uh, why is it nice? It's nice because it uses all of this data, 
time, which nearest neighbor matching does not do, it weights things by their probabilities. Because I have a few minutes, uh, that's what I'm going to say. It's nice because under certain assumptions, it, it obtains the semi parametric efficiency bound. What does that mean? That means it's the analog for semi parametric models of the Kremer Ralmore bound for parametric models. Right? So IPW is minimum variance under certain assumptions within the class of semi parametric treatment by estimators. So it's not true in your information. So it's more efficient. It's using the data more efficiently. That's a nice feature. The problem with IBW, and if you poke a biostatistician, for example, uh, like Elizabeth Stewart is a very famous biostatistician in her treatment effects world, the student of Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum, no, Ruben. Ruben. Uh, they will cite these papers from the biostat literature, and you can see the same thing in the economic <coughs> papers, that IBW runs into trouble when P hat is near zero or one. That's not surprising, you're dividing by P hat, right? Dividing by numbers close to zero and one causes things to blow up. <laughs> if in your application you have a lot of p-hats that are like 0. 0.0001, probably not the place to use IPW, or you need to use one of the variants of IPW in the literature that tries to sort of it, it, it accepts some bias by moving the p-hat away from zero in exchange for a lot more variants, right? And then you promise to do less of that as your sample size gets bigger. So Lechner has some of that. So IPW is very nice. There is another estimator. Ah, here's this quote. Oh, here's quote. Oh, my former colleague Justin McCrary, a card student. Matching is an attempt to approximate what we're waiting is doing directly. So Justin is an advocate. Yes, he's from an aficionado of free weighting, uh, and his work has done much to rehabilitate his name. All right, bandwidth choice is important, common support is important, balance is important, <laughs> variant estimation is important. <laughs> I want to spend the last two minutes uh, just mentioning these papers here. So there's a literature, as I mentioned, that sort of does Monte Carlo analyses to try to investigate the properties of different matching and weighting estimators in the context of data generating processes that are known and that mimic sometimes, better than others, the data generating processes that we might encounter in actual applications. So this was a very important early paper, paper by Marcus Froelich, who's Lechner student. Key problem with that paper is that his implementation of inverse intensity weighting did not force the weights to sum to one in the sample. So the formula I put up there didn't force the weights to sum to one in the sample. It turns out that forcing them to sum to one in the sample, which they have to do in the population, is important to the variance of the estimator. So IPW looks really bad in this paper. And I weighed this paper at McCrary and Donardo for many years at Michigan, which I think was probably responsible for them eventually writing this paper, which is now forthcoming in 2014 in the Review of Economic Statistics, that is, you can view as an update in part of Froelich. It also takes account of other developments in the literature it's also more informed by the theoretically econometric literature that Philip was. This is a really nice paper. I think I put it on the internet and I encourage you to look at it. There's a sort of competing paper, which is already published by Huber, Lechner, and Wunsch. Huber and Wunsch are students of Lechner. The main difference between this and this is that these guys have chosen their simulated data for their Monte Carlo analysis to be much more like real data than these guys. They call it thing empirical Monte Carlo or something like that. And they've developed a scheme for mimicking real data better when they pick their, their Monte Carlo data. These are really cool papers. And you will learn a lot from them about when to use which estimator. All right, there's more about that. There's some activity analysis, which I'm in favor of. There's some every treatment assignment, which is cool. Blah, blah. Conclusions. <laughs> Sorry about that. I didn't. I thought I'd get you a little more than I did. I was sure I wouldn't. What are the points here? Selection on observed variable is a really strong assumption. Most papers do a bad job of justifying it. They could do better. If you use it, you can do better. I encourage you to do that. Theory and existing evidence and institutions are all part of making that case. Given that you're going to assume selection on observed variables, the literature offers you a whole bunch of different estimators. The literature also provides you with some Monte Carlo analyses and some theoretical econometric studies 
to help you choose which estimator is best in your particular context, given the nature of your data generating process. You should familiarize yourself with that literature if you're going to use these estimators. Right? There really is no good reason to be running parametric regression models where the X is only entered as main effect in 2014. Right? There just is no good reason for that. Part of what these estimators buy you, an important part of what these estimators buy you, is implicitly more flexibility and functional form. And sometimes that's not going to matter. Sometimes the linear regression where the X is only entered as main effect is pretty close to the truth. But sometimes it's not. And it's really cheap to figure out whether you're in the context where it's not or not. And you can do that. Uh, we've learned a lot about the different estimators, blah, 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 blah. You should not become a Rubenoid. Matching is not a magic bullet, OK? I want to be very clear about that. Cool. If you may be listening somewhere. Uh, the point of this part of the lecture, and the point of talking about these methods, is not that you say, oh, PSM, blah, 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 I solved the problem. And there was a period in economics, just like I'm old enough to remember the period where you could say, I did the Heckman two-step with no exclusion restriction. And that would shut down the questions about the selection problem. I know this is hard to believe. I saw this at seminars in Chicago, that somebody would be doing their paper and somebody would raise their hand and say, well, what did you do about, about selections? And the person would say, I did the Heckman two-step. And in that era, yes, I mean, it's like the Heckman culture did, you know, the Heckman two-step. And in that era, it was being done with no exclusion restriction. So the same variables in the outcome equation, the risk-based equation. And everybody would nod and say, oh, very good. You're right at the frontier of the literature. Very good. Very good. No selection problem. Uh, and then we went through a similar phase of propensity score matching. Oh, no. Crazy score. Oh, you solved the problem. No. There's no magic bullet. Magic's not a magic bullet. Not even random time is a magic bullet. You always have to think about what you're doing. Uh, so, but sometimes if you're going, if selection of their variables is plausible in your case, and you make that case, then you want to think about these different estimators and make an informed choice. I'll stop there. Thank you very much.